I'm Luke Haig, a criminalist and forensic firearms examiner involved in the examination of such evidence. In this initial tape, we're going to look at some basic information concerning firearms ammunition, its construction, bullet design, propellants, firearms design, how the cartridge and the firearm uh, go together, uh, how marks are created on cartridges and bullets. Of course, I'll discuss uh, briefly how the identifications are made. But more importantly, this is background information that's useful to a wide variety of audiences. A reading of any police report or trial transcript has frequently revealed that investigators and lawyers on both sides don't really fully understand or exploit uh, this valuable evidence. So there are a number of audiences out there I intend to address. First of all, the police officers who first arrive on the scene of a shooting incident. The detectives that will follow up in that investigation and evaluate uh, and gather evidence and submit it to the laboratory. Some agencies have special shooting response teams that are involved in, in the investigation of officer-involved shootings. Criminalists and crime laboratories that work in other units of the laboratory, such as trace evidence, uh, serology, that need a better understanding of what the firearms examiner does so the two of them can combine their efforts in the effective solution of a case. Prosecuting attorneys, of course, who represent the state in crimes involving criminal use of firearms, really in three respects. First of all, they must interact with the police investigators and the laboratory in formulating the appropriate protocol for the analysis of the evidence. Secondly, they have to prepare for trial. They have to understand what those findings are and how they relate to the charge. And lastly, obviously, actual trial presentation of technical witnesses, investigators, and preparation for redirect examination or rehabilitation of their own experts. That leads to defense attorneys who must understand what tests were carried out by the laboratory, what the purpose was, what the findings mean, if the proper tests were indeed carried out, and finally, what could or should uh, may still need to be done. Civil attorneys, both plaintiff and defense, in three areas, products liability, where a firearm or ammunition is alleged to be defective, accidental shootings, hunting accidents, for example. Uh, and finally, again, officer-involved shootings, where agencies typically find themselves being sued as a consequence of such an incident. Last group would be forensic pathologists and or emergency room surgeons, who are involved in recovering not only projectiles, but oftentimes describing the injury, locating trace evidence associated with such injuries, powder particles, for example, and ultimately turning those matters over to the investigators. In this tape, we're going to look at ammunition construction, bullet design, propellants, the design of the firearms, how the ammunition fits in those guns and receives marks from it, uh, identification, of course, and finally, a little bit about shotgun evidence, a whole separate category. And that leads us to the two types of cartridges that we'll be involved with. They can fit in one of two categories. Metallic cartridges, which have a bullet of some kind, a brass or metallic cartridge case with the propellant and some sort of primer, something to ignite this propellant charge and drive the bullet out the bore of the gun. A very different type of ammunition that is on occasion involved in crimes are shotguns. And a shotgun shell is a very complicated affair, uh, behaves very differently than bulleted ammunition, as we'll see. So we can put things in those two broad categories. In the metallic cartridges, we have, again, a subdivision. 22 rimfire being the most common cartridge that crime laboratories have encountered over the years and probably accounts for more deaths than any other cartridge, uh, and yet is thought of as not a particularly powerful round. This particular illustration is just a small sampling of various brands of 22 rimfire cartridges. And I'll describe more about how these are constructed in a moment. But before that, there are three loadings commonly available in 22 rimfire. The 22 short, which has a, as the name would suggest, a short cartridge case and a small, nominally 27, 29 grain lead bullet, sometimes with a copper veneer or wash over it, a plating. The next loading is the 22 long. Now this has a longer cartridge case, but uses the same bullet that the 22 short does. So if we were to find bullets from of this type at a crime scene without the cartridge case, they could be from either 22 short or 22 long since they are the very same except for the length of the cartridge case. The next four examples in this illustration are three different companies' versions or brands or loadings of 22 long rifle. Here, if you look at the illustration, you'll see that the cartridge case is the same length as the long, but the bullet is bigger. In fact, visually, it's longer. 
And indeed, in a 22 long rifle cartridge, those bullets will typically weigh uh, nominally 40 grains, grain being the unit of weight used in American ammunition. There are a total of 7,000 grains in a pound if you're trying to get some kin or sense for what that amounts to. There are some other features in these four bullets I draw your attention to. Notice that the first two are copper colored. That's not really a jacket, that's simply a thin plating that's been deposited on an otherwise lead bullet. We can also see some knurling, some indentations on each one of these bullets. One on the one on the left happens to be made by Federal, one of the big four in ammunition manufacture in the United States. Uh, the next cartridge happens to be one made by Winchester, and it has three of these little knurled grooves. We'll talk a lot more about those in other types of ammunition, but to start using terms that we should become familiar with, that's called a cantilever. The next bullet, also made by Winchester, is essentially indistinguishable from the previous bullet, except that it lacks the copper plating. In fact, Winchester has a patented name for that copper plating process. It's called Lubaloy. So here's a product they've prepared with and without the Lubaloy or the copper plating. The last bullet, also a 22 long rifle, the cartridge case is the same length as the previous three. It also has cantilevering on it. We can see two cantilevers on that particular bullet. It also has a copper plating or finish, but it has a very different shape. And that particular type or shape is called a truncated cone. We can see the conical shape that if it continued, it'd lead to a point. It's simply been truncated. Now, each one of these projectiles, if we were to look at them from a top view, may also be hollow pointed. That is, they could, the manufacturer could uh, form a hollow cavity in the nose of this projectile to improve its expansion characteristics in game animals or tissue simulants. Here are six more 22 long rifle cartridges, again with a little more variety to give you a feeling of yet another feature called the head stamp. That is the written information on the base of the cartridge that's useful in deciding what brand of ammunition uh, is involved in a particular incident. I've also added another somewhat unusual 22 long rifle cartridge, at least it qualifies as a 22 long rifle by the industry, uh, called a Stinger made by CCI, or Omark Industries. And here's their unique uh, head stamp, a letter C on the base of this nickel-plated cartridge, different than the other five we're looking at. It, too, has a copper-plated bullet. This is not a jacketed bullet. It's simply a lead bullet with a thin copper plating. But the unique thing about this particular round is the lack of any cantilevers. And at this time, this is 1991, that's the only 22 round I'm aware of made in the United States, at least, that lacks any cantilevering. And that could be useful in deciding, even from a bullet fragment, which of these six uh, candidates or examples we're dealing with. The next one we've seen uh, previously, that's the Winchester with three knurled cantilevers, the Lubaloy plating, and although it's upside down, we can see a head stamp uh, that reads Super X, a very popular head stamp that if you've shot 22s and picked up cartridges, you've probably seen a bunch of these. Here's that look-alike with the lead bullet without the plating, and that's presently being loaded by Winchester in a product called the 22 Wildcat, hence the stylized W on their cartridge. Here's our federal cartridge we saw earlier with an F for a head stamp. The next one we haven't seen yet, also a very popular cartridge, uh, Remington's entry into the 22 long rifle uh, product line. And this is their previous head stamp, a letter U that Remington has historically used for many, many years until about several years ago when they switched to an REM. A little easier to understand the, the origin with that particular head stamp. The U came historically from the Union Metallic Cartridge Company of the Civil War era on into this century. But look at the Remington bullet for a moment. It also has a brassy finish instead of a copper colored finish. And that's useful information because it sets the Remington bullets apart from all the other manufacturers. If, for example, we had a bullet that was badly damaged, we had several shooters, we saw that some of the cartridge casings were Federal from one person's gun. Some of the cartridge casings were Remington that we could identify with another individual's gun. But basically all we had was a splattered bullet or a heavily damaged bullet, unsuitable for identification. But if we could see that brassy finish, if our population is just those two, if the universe of available guns and ammunition in that case are those two choices, then we can say, by exclusion, it can't be the Federal or the Winchester because this bullet fragment has this Remington finish on it. 
So that's part of, part of my thesis in this presentation. There are many things we can do with firearms evidence when we can't make an identification, when we don't have the ability to identify the, the responsible gun because of terminal ballistic damage, uh, other, other reasons. Here's the one I showed you earlier, the truncated cone bullet and the Remington head stamp, the new style head stamp. Here's a little more expanded view of some head stamps still in 22 rimfire. And again, I'll add a little information with each uh, description. Here's CCIs that I described earlier. They recently, I reiterate this is 91, they've just gone to a slightly reduced C, still the same style. Here's our Super X right side up. Uh, the U for Remington, the contemporary REM. Here's a very old Winchester round with the H on it. Uh, this is a European round, a letter D with a Z in the middle of it. Again, another round from Germany with a shield and a letter R. Uh, this CI head stamp you're looking at is a Mexican cartridge that's being imported uh, by uh, technical industries near uh, Mexico City. The Z, which is probably very vague, is also an import and several other imports in the lower row that instead of having letters or names simply have some sort of symbol. Uh, PMC ammunition also being imported and soon to be made in the United States uh, simply has this double triangle. I've added three others here that have firing pin impressions to start orienting you to why they're called a rim fire cartridge. The priming mixture, the material that makes the propellant burn in a rim fire cartridge is located out in this rim and it is literally pinched by the firing pin of the gun at the moment of impact of the firing pin. That detonates the priming mixture, ignites the propellant, and of course the bullet then's driven out the barrel. But in a fired rim fire cartridge, somewhere around this rim will be located a firing pin impression. And it can be rectangular, it can be round, it can be hemispherical. In fact, in this last example, the cartridge with the F on it, which we now should realize is made by Federal, it's triangular. That particular one happens to have been fired in one of my own reference guns, a Marlin. The other type of cartridge I mentioned is a general categorization. Center fire cartridges are ignited in a very different way. As the name suggests, center fire, they have a primer. This is a fixture, a little cup, that has an explosive mixture in it, a literally shock-sensitive explosive mixture that when the firing pin crushes that material in the primer cup, a jet of flame and sparks uh, are driven through a small opening called a flash hole into the propellant charge. In this particular uh, cutaway, uh, we can see the cartridge case filled with smokeless powder. In this case, it's a form called ball powder, all the way up to the base of the bullet, which also has been cross-sectioned. And in this particular example, we have a copper jacketed bullet. This is not a plating or a thin veneer, but rather an actual formed copper jacket or cup in which the lead core has been inserted. Here's some representative examples going from pistol cartridges on up to a rifle cartridge that are all center fire. On the left is a European 9mm Parabellum, sometimes called 9mm Luger. The bullet is a full metal jacketed bullet with a uh, nickel plating on it to give it that silvery color. The next cartridge is another 9mm cartridge. This one happens to be made in Israel. And the black tip is an indicator that it's meant strictly for a particular type of firearm, namely the Uzi submachine gun. And the reason is the pressures that this cartridge develops are greater than those that handguns are designed to handle. Backing up to the previous cartridge, one might see a, a slight color difference, a, a browner color to that cartridge. That cartridge is made of steel with an epoxy or plastic-like uh, coating on it. That brings up another point. Cartridges, the metal fixture in which the bullet is seated and the propellant is held, commonly are made of brass in the United States, but they can also be made of steel, and that's very popular in Europe, in the uh, communist countries, because of the scarcity of brass and the expense. There are also a few, one particular in the United States, that's even made of aluminum, and we'll come to that. The next cartridge has a brass case, but it's been nickel plated, and it has a lead bullet in it which has been coated with nylon. This is Federal's NICLAD, so there would be a, an absolutely unique item at this time, a bullet that's completely plated or covered with a nylon plating, or I'm sorry, a nylon coating. 
And that, uh, for interest perhaps, uh, is to reduce lead levels in indoor shooting ranges. It also makes the identification process rather difficult. The next bullet also has some interest uh, because it has shown up in two shooting cases, one in Nevada, one in California, and yet at the same time is a very rare and scarce item. To some observers out there it may look familiar, uh, but that's only illusionary. This 38 special round brass cartridge case with what appears to be a round nose copper jacketed bullet is a common round or appears to be a common round that our military issued to Air Force pilots. In fact, this particular bullet was a research project and it's actually a steel bullet. Well, one might ask, well, how can a steel bullet look copper colored? What they've done in this particular instance is simply put a copper plating on the projectile. And I have one of these rounds here, one from one of the actual cases, that if you were to pick it up or find this bullet at a scene, you might believe you're looking at a copper jacketed bullet. But in fact, as this magnet will reveal, we've got a steel bullet. Now that may seem esoteric, but that can lead to the solution or resolution of an issue in a case. For example, television is ruining, ruining us all as far as what jurors expect to hear firearms do when they hear testimony in the courtroom, even citizens anticipating what they should see when guns are fired. We all now know from watching television for the last two years that bullets make sparks when they hit walls and sidewalks. That's not true. Brass and copper, lead don't make sparks. But that bullet that I just showed you, being steel, if it were to hit the sidewalk, indeed we might see what's depicted commonly on television. The last cartridge in this particular illustration uh, is the contemporary Soviet AK-74 round. It's very similar to our 5.56 millimeter cartridge insofar as what it's intended for, uh, its caliber, its velocity. But I've put it up here for, for several reasons. Uh, we can see that with rifle bullets, they're quite long. The typical characteristic of a pistol bullet is big and short, and usually with a straight cartridge case with no shoulder in it. Typical rifle cartridges have a bottleneck or a shoulder in them and the bullets they shoot are typically very long as compared to their diameter. And this bullet is especially so. It also has a red lacquer sealing the area between the bullet and the mouth of the cartridge case. This lacquer can survive the actual discharge process even though it's on the bearing surface of the bullet. And that again can be useful trace evidence as we'll see in some other cases later. Here's a lineup of a number of rifle cartridges, now that you've got the idea that rifle cartridges typically, some exceptions, are a bottlenecked cartridge with a long bullet. Uh, these are quite colorful in that they've also got painted tips, some orange, some red, some blue. Depending on the country of origin, these are indicators for whether the projectile, the bullet, is either armor piercing, incendiary, or tracer, with or without a delay. Not many shootings or crimes occur with this ammunition, but nonetheless, they do on occasion occur. In fact, there's a very well done case by a criminalist in California where this orange material you can see on the last example on the right was left in the feed ramp of a hunter's rifle where a forest fire was created by a tracer bullet. And this particular individual denied ever firing tracer ammunition in his rifle. He volunteered the gun to the game warden and the laboratory in connection with an officer who understood something about this kind of ammunition, even though the bullet was burned and discolored when they found it at the point of origin, submitted that rifle to the laboratory to be examined. And traces of this color and this type of paint were located in the feed ramp, in the mechanism, again, something we'll talk more about in a moment, of the rifle taken from the hunter. Confronted with that sort of evidence, the man confessed to his involvement in shooting these rounds into a wooded area. So, my thesis again, understanding something about ammunition and the relationships, the exchanges that can take place between ammunition and gun or impact or target becomes very important. The only pistol round I have in this picture is on the far left. It's a little 25 automatic, but it too, although it may be difficult to see, has this colored lacquer between the case mouth and the bullet. That can be again left in the gun, it can survive, and some of it will still be on the bullet after discharge. Another product line, that of Winchesters, that's achieved uh, some popularity, uh, particularly in the law enforcement community. This round, or this line of ammunition is called Silver Tip. Some, not all of these, have a very unique uh, construction in that the jacket, 
that's the portion that's around the lead core of the bullet, is composed of aluminum. Now up to this point I've talked to you about lead bullets, lead bullets with a thin copper plating, lead cores inside of copper jackets, steel bullets, steel bullets with copper plating. Now we've got a bullet that again is constructed with a lead core but it has an aluminum jacket around it. Uh, for example, the 380 automatic and 32 automatic entries, the 45 automatic entries into this particular product line have aluminum instead of uh, copper jackets. The ones that look quite shiny in this illustration, for example, 9 millimeter, is actually a copper jacket with a nickel plating on it. Well, the point of all this is several fold. Let's imagine we have a person deceased from a gunshot injury. The medical examiner pulls out what appears to be a lead bullet. And x-rays reveal one radio-opaque object. Close inspection of that lead bullet reveals it's simply a core. And I'll illustrate or give you an example of one of those if I can take just a moment. I have here both a fired and unfired 380 automatic Winchester silver tip projectile. Here's the unfired projectile and here's a recovered projectile from a decedent in two parts, the separated aluminum jacket and the lead core that to the casual observer, and that may even be a medical examiner or a detective, looks like a fired bullet. Some of the rifling impressions have actually printed through this very thin aluminum jacket into the core, but they're not striated. They're simply faint, smooth vestiges of the rifling engravings, and that's the tip-off. So it would behoove investigators to have the laboratory give them something like this so they're familiar with this problem. And here's the problem. This is the entity, the item, that the identification of the responsible gun will be made on. It doesn't show up on x-rays. It may well still be in the body. So if you're the detective at the autopsy scene, the medical examiner pulls out a core, with or without the knowledge that you may be dealing with a silver tip, the likelihood is this little item is still down in the body somewhere and they're going to have to go back and look for it. An exhumation or looking through cremation remains is a real pain and these indeed may go through the screen and I have done this, gone through cremation remains looking for things like this because the initial investigators failed to recognize the separation of a jacket, a bullet jacket. This particular illustration is from Remington and it's useful because it shows us something more about bullet design. We've got a number of types of projectiles here, some of which we've talked about. Here's a copper jacketed bullet with an exposed lead core. Here's our cantaloupe that we've talked about. But let's look at that one for a moment. Notice the scalloping of the jacket as it meets the lead. Right now, that's a patented process of Remington and protected by them. How would that be useful? Once again, all bullets don't come out pristine from shootings. They can hit brick walls, the sides of police cars, and even break up on bone inside of bodies. If we simply had this portion, a piece of that scallop jacket, we'd at least be able to say we're dealing with a Remington bullet. And again, in many shootings, our universe of possible guns and ammunition may be just two or three shooters. One officer armed with Remington ammunition from Agency A, and Officer B uh, with Winchester silver tip. And if that's the question, who scored this hit or who made this shot, uh, we could resolve it just on what are called class characteristics, the manufacturing features of the bullet. Look at another example. Remington also makes bullets with a, just a sharp boundary between the exposed lead core in this example and the copper jacket. Notice that the cantaloupe on that bullet against the previous one is at a very different position. So here's another opportunity. Let's say we otherwise have bullets that are the same caliber, same basic weight, but the position of the cantaloupe can be useful in determining what that original bullet weight was. The manufacturer has put that there with mathematical precision for a purpose, and it's partly product identification. The next bullet is commonly associated with semi-automatics and submachine guns, full metal jacketed bullets, just like the movie, full metal jacket. Here is one. The copper jacket extends all the way around the core, usually lead, of the bullet. That means that the lead had to be inserted from the back end. Let's go back to the previous bullet. Think about it a minute. If you've got a copper jacket and you're going to put a lead core in it, you're going to have it exposed at the nose, then the lead has to go in from the front end. And we can see those features even in badly damaged bullets, that they have an open base. In other words, the lead 
was introduced from the base of the bullet, I immediately know when I see that that I was dealing with a full metal jacketed bullet, even though it may be badly damaged. Conversely, if I have an enclosed base and can find some termination point of a jacket, then I was dealing with either a hollow point or a soft point. The next bullet down, popular in target shooting, it's called a wad cutter, as it cuts a little wad of paper out of the target. Also cuts nice round holes in people or clothing. And this one has three cantalures and they're of different sizes. Again, that would undoubtedly be unique to Remington's wad cutter as opposed to Winchester, Federal, and other companies that make wad cutter bullets. The top of the chart on the other side, we have a semi wad cutter. It's nearly flattened off, but it's got somewhat of a conical nose which has been truncated, hence semi wad cutter. The next round's fairly uncommon now, a metal point where they put a copper cup or point over the nose of the bullet and the rest is lead. The next one has what's called a gas check on it. This is simply a little copper cup that protects the base of the bullet during firing and it protects it from the erosion of lead and the leading of the bore of the gun, a problem that reduces accuracy. And these little copper gas checks sometimes will fall away or break away. Um, when a bullet impacts something or goes into a body, uh, occasionally they'll even separate in flight, but that's usually a, a problem with putting the bullet together. The important thing is they tell me again something about the kind of bullet I'm dealing with. They also have rifling engravings on them because those gas checks are in the bearing area, the bearing surface of the bullet. They contacted the riflings of the gun. And the bottom one's probably, uh, at least traditionally, the most common pistol bullet we encounter, uh, just a normal lead round nose bullet, uh, popularly used, for example, in 38 Special and 158 grain loading. Police officers for years carried this round until more contemporary ammunition came online. In this uh, illustration, I've separated the bullets from four 38 Special cartridges. And again, they all illustrate something about the, the great variety we can find in ammunition that can be useful in resolving a, a question. Silver tip, you've already seen, is on the left. We can see the cantalure. This is one that happens to have an aluminum jacket. You can also see, perhaps, a little bit of amber, wax-like material in that cantalure. That's a special lubricant, a proprietary product to keep the aluminum from galling as that has driven up the barrel of the gun. That was one of the technical problems in developing aluminum jacketed bullets. That material doesn't melt totally. It doesn't burn up. It's not against the powder gases. So that may become trace evidence that can be spattered on clothing or wiped off on clothing as a bullet goes through. How would we use that? Let's say a bullet goes completely through. Use my arm as an example. I get shot in my left arm, bullet passes through my coat, shirt, on out the other side. But we've got traces of what? Aluminum and possibly this lubricant that we'd be able to say if we understood and appreciated that and talked to the laboratory that this, this injury was created by a silver tip bullet. And I know that for those two reasons. And we may have other shooters firing at me as this hypothetical uh, uh, assailant or victim. The next bullet's somewhat unusual. That happens to be made by Federal. And it has no knurled cantalures. Now, I've probably used that term several times. Knurling means these little slices, these little indentations that we see on the other two. All cantalures don't have to be knurled. Some of them can simply be grooves. Uh, this cartridge also has a cantalure in another place, on the cartridge case. Look down on the cartridge case in this particular example, and you'll see a little knurled cantalure. That's, again, a product identifier. Not that it's so much federal. We'll know that by looking at the head stamp, but that it's a particular loading of federal's ammunition. So the bullet shot, it's history. It's out there somewhere. But we've got this cartridge case. And the question is, could the bullet we've dug out of the side of the police unit have come from this particular cartridge? That's one way to address that question, because another product line by federal will either have the cantaloupe in a different place or none whatsoever. The next one's kind of an interesting one also because here's an example of a cartridge with an aluminum case, the one that is light blue. This is made by Omark Industries, or Blount as they're now called. It also has a copper jacketed bullet, an aluminum case that I've already pointed out has been anodized in blue. That's the case with this example because it has a very special priming composition in it that I'll uh, perhaps talk about later. The bullet has a nerve cantalure, but it's interesting in another way. That particular bullet has a copper jacket completely around it. And right now, again, 91, that's a unique process by Omark Industries called their TMJ, their Total Metal Jacketed Bullet. 
And the jacketing of that bullet is absolutely electrolytically pure copper, whereas the others will be alloyed with zinc. It is also bonded because it's a plating process uh, to the core, the lead core of the bullet. So this too can be determined at the laboratory both by microscopic inspection and by analytical methodology. Even if we just had a fragment of a broken up bullet to be able to say this was a TMJ, a total metal jacketed bullet, only one company right now that makes that. So we're looking for a cartridge that's made by CCI and it'll say so on the head stamp of those cartridges. Uh, the last one just happens to be another uh, jacketed projectile with a cantilever in a similar area uh, and a cantilever on the cartridge case. Okay, I've said head stamps several times and we looked at head stamps on 22 rimfire cartridges. That's that written information on, some people might call it the base of the cartridge, technically it's the head of the cartridge. Center fire cartridges, as that one cutaway showed us, have a primer located in the center of the cartridge which the firing pin strikes. Here's some illustrations, some drawings of a variety of, of head stamps. And these are useful not only because they fascinate some people who've, who've become collectors of them, but because they tell us something. Take a look. You'll see two up there that say RP38S&W. And if you study them, you'll see that one has a dot between the R and the P and another has a dash. That's intentional. And there was a particular year for that cartridge designation that Remington went from a dash to a dot. So it sets a point in time after which one type of cartridge was made and before which the other was made. How could that possibly be useful? Well, if we knew and we can find out when these things were introduced, discontinued, started up, tells us something about the age of the ammunition. Subject claims that he took granddad's old uh, rifle down off the uh, mantelpiece. It had never been examined or shot in probably 40 or 50 years. He didn't realize it was loaded. He turned toward his brother with whom he'd been having an argument for some several days and it went off accidentally. If we were to open that gun up, and it's going to get opened up no doubt, and remove a cartridge that was only made a year ago, introduced a year ago, the story doesn't, doesn't hold. It can't have been sitting around for 30 years with a cartridge in it that didn't exist until 1990. And we can play that scenario other ways. So the age of the ammunition as derived from the head stamp uh, can be very useful. Some are much more rare or unusual than others. Here are some actual head stamps. Drawings are perhaps useful, but in actuality, uh, let's see what they look like. Here's the one I just talked about. has the RP, standing for Remington Peters. Uh, it also tells us the cartridge designation, 9mm Luger. Most American ammunition will tell us what we're dealing with. Uh, 380 automatic, 45 automatic, 38 special, and so on. There will be others, however, that are not quite as descriptive, that uh, are military or foreign head stamps, and we'll again uh, show some of those a little later. I've also placed some on this illustration that are fired, so we can now see what the primer looks like before the cartridge is discharged and afterwards. And for some examples of that, if we go to the third one over, Winchester cartridge, that's been fired by a Glock. In fact, a Glock leaves a very unique firing pin impression and breech face signature on the primer. Uh, the next Winchester cartridge has a more typical hemispherical firing pin impression in it. Might also notice that some of the primers are nickel plated or shiny, look like chrome, while others appear to be brass or copper colored. Again, that's intentional by the manufacturers. In this particular illustration, I've removed the primers from the two types of ignition systems that are used in the world. One of them is called the Boxer method. Boxer, oddly enough, was a man in England. That happens to be the system that we use almost universally in the United States. And the Boxer method has a single flash hole. This is the opening through which the jet of flame and sparks goes to ignite the powder when the primer is struck. The Burdan, named after an American who developed it, has two flash holes with a thing called an anvil. This is a raised piece of metal between which the cup of the primer, as struck by the firing pin, is pinched or crushed. In American or boxer primers, the anvil is built right into the primer. And here's an example. We're looking down inside of three primers where the explosive composition is located underneath that little two or three-legged anvil. The others I've turned up from the view you would have if you were a firing pin and going to strike these. In fact, I've put one in here that's been removed from a fired cartridge so you can see a firing pin impression in a fired primer. 
and finally that same primer or type of primer with the caked, uh, gritty sort of residue. Again, this may seem uh, overwhelming at first and very, uh, very technical, but there's a plethora of information that arises out of these primers and the composition that's in them that ends up on surfaces, on clothing, and on the hands of shooters uh, that's useful in a number of ways. Here, for example, are three common mixtures or formulations. And I've not identified the companies because these are proprietary products. But if you read through this list, you'll see something that's the same in all three of these mixtures. Barium in the form of barium nitrate, antimony in the form of antimony sulfide, and lead in the form of an explosive called lead stiffnate. Those three elements, barium, lead, and antimony, survive the discharge process. So when a gun is fired, that jet of flame and sparks that goes through the flash hole and ignites the powder gets rearranged all right. It explodes and burns, but you can't really burn lead, barium, and antimony. Those are elements. And they come out much like hairspray comes out of a hairsprayer. They are an aerosol that surrounds the hand of the shooter and, of course, creates quite a cloud of debris in front of and sometimes to the side of the gun. And those are the elements that the analyst in the crime laboratory uses to characterize gunshot residue. That's one method of characterizing gunshot residue. The, the traditional paraffin test, which is uh, passe for many years, was for nitrites and nitrates. This is for the elements, the contemporary testing is for the elements in the priming mixture. On the home stretch on discussing bullets, but I really need to, to cover a couple of uh, areas that I haven't so far. In this display of pistol bullets, we've got several other new things that I'm going to add into your repertoire of information. The bullet on the upper left is a cast bullet. Now, so far I've shown you a number of lead bullets, 22 bullets with and without copper plating and some other uh, 38 uh, caliber bullets. Those were swedged. They were literally forced into a mold under high pressure. They were extruded and formed. That's how they get the cantaluring in there. Cast bullets uh, are just that. They're cast in a bullet mold. And I've brought one of my own uh, bullet molds with me today. And this process simply involves taking molten lead from a ladle, delivering it to this two-part mold through the opening, usually taking a piece of wood to break this open, such as I have now. And then we can open up the mold, and if it doesn't drop out, see a cast bullet. Well, I've added emphasis to that word about three times now. Because this mold is split in half, it has to be to get it open, that leaves a seam, a very faint seam on the edge of the bullet. So look again at the bullet at the upper left. You can see the lubricant. You can see the grooves in that bullet, and they are filled with an amber-colored lubricant. We've talked about the use of lubricants as trace evidence. But you can also see the seam from the mold that cast it. That survives discharge. We can usually find that somewhere on the bullet. And that again is useful because if we have a shooter that's using hand-loaded ammunition, it may indeed be loaded with such bullets. We may have a supply of lead at his residence that could be compared with the composition of the lead in a cast bullet. And it actually may be a unique formulation given the type of scrap wheel weights and metals that he's made it from. You can also, on occasion, identify the bullet mold from which the bullet was cast. The imperfections that are in that mold are being replicated in the cast bullet. And if we go down into areas such as the base of the bullet, those lubrication grooves that usually survive impact, we might be able to find that sort of identifying information. And even though we can't match the gun, let's say because the bullet's too damaged, we might be able to say that bullet came from that casting mold, which is in the workshop of the defendant. Okay, some other bullets here. Here is indeed a swedged bullet right next to it, formed by simply extrusion with a neural cantalure. I've put up here another cast bullet for you. They don't all have to be round nose. We've got one here that's a semi wad cutter that I discussed earlier. How do I know it's cast? Look at the seam. This one has a black lubricant in it, so even the color of the lubricants may be different and again, be a clue. This one has a gas check on it. I talked about gas checks. The previous one on the left does not. Next to that is, again, a, at this time, a unique item. This is made by the Hornaday Company, and it has a stippled, some might call it a knurled texture, in which they've placed the lubricant. So the waxy lubricant that keeps the lead from, from galling or leading up the bore of the gun is actually impregnated in all those little diamond-shaped checkerings. 
Again, it would identify the product if I found, and I have encountered this particular bullet in several shootings, as a Hornaday bullet. But there's something else that's fascinating about this bullet. In addition to a lubricant, it has a mineral called pyrophyllite. It's a mineral similar to talc. That doesn't burn. It really doesn't rub away that well. So now after firing such a bullet, we've got pyrophyllite residues in the barrel of the gun. There's still some on the bullet. And if it goes through my clothing, or anyone's clothing for that matter, or a wall, around that bullet hole in a material called bullet wipe will be traces of pyrophyllite. And even though the bullet may go on out through the window or curtain and across the countryside and never be found, I've now got a way, if I know something about ammunition, to say that particular bullet hole was a Hornaday bullet because of the presence of the pyrophyllite in the bullet wipings. Now next year someone else may infringe upon their process, but at this moment, and that's why, again, the purpose of this tape is one must remain current as to what's going on in the industry. Here's a way to resolve a situation uh, of what kind of bullet or what shot went through it. A wad cutter, the next bullet we've already seen, another full metal jacketed bullet, a full metal jacketed bullet with a cantalure. Uh, here's one of our silver tip bullets in the bottom left row. And now we can start to see a few other features. Some of these companies will notch the bullet jacket to help it expand upon impact in, in tissue or game animals. Um, that often survives and like the Remington scalloping that I already described could allow us to resolve one company's bullet from another just by finding this sort of uh, class characteristic on the projectile. And we've got a couple more here. Here's a 9 millimeter contemporary police loading, the subsonic 9 millimeter 147 grain bullet, third over from the right on the bottom row. Uh, a jacketed semi-wad cutter for target shooting primarily. And another one of our uh, silver tip bullets, that one happens to be in 45 automatic and it happens to have an aluminum jacket. The same bullets you just saw have now been turned up in so we can look at the nose shapes. We could only see them in profile a moment ago. And here we can see some of them are hollow pointed. Some of them have the notching that's a little more visible and apparent. Uh, some of them have other features such as the wad cutter, almost a ring-like feature. Uh, in that particular projectile. I'm going to go through to sort of bring together uh, distinguishing uh, brands where everything else is the same. In these seven examples of 357 Magnum ammunition, the bullet weight is the same, 158 grains. But we have at least, uh, we have four companies represented and in one particular line we've got three entries from the same company, Federal. Here are these same cartridges, one example from each where I've pulled the bullet out of the cartridge and set it beside it. We can look at the head stamp if we wish to, if you wish to go back and find this area in the tape and look at it more closely. Here we can look at the base of each of these bullets and see some differences, even though the weight and the caliber is the same. And again, the base, of course, is one of the areas that survives best when bullets hit very hard objects. Some of these cartridge cases have case cantalures, others do not. I've already mentioned the potential importance of that. Now here's a little closer view of each one of these projectiles, bullets, pulled out of the cartridge case and then I've written on the cartridges so we can go back and forth. Notice some of the things, the number of cantalures, the position of the cantalure, the general uh, features of the bullet's uh, surface, whether it's jacketed or lead. Uh, scalloping in the case of the Remington that I talked about earlier versus a straight union between the lead and the jacket, the presence or absence of notching. All of these features often survive substantial damage upon impact. Okay, let's start bringing the other components together. Here's a disassembled, should be able to spot it by now, a Remington bullet. It's got a scalloped jacket, cantalure. This is the propellant charge, smokeless powder, nitrocellulose, uh, in a particular form in this particular round of ammunition. The cartridge case, nickel plated brass. Um, and here are two fired Remington bullets of the type you just saw, but there's something different between the two. Look at the bases of them. One of them has a stepped base, as the industry calls it. There's a little indent on the base of the one on the right. The base of the Remington bullet on the left is smooth or flat. That's a product or manufacturing change that we have a date for. It occurred on a particular date where they retooled and Remington now makes that bullet that would otherwise look indistinguishable with a flat base. So what? 
Well, a very famous case in Utah where a man was shot to death confronting the police uh, and there was an issue about whether he was gunned down by police officers from Agency A, B, or C. They were all carrying Remington 357 Magnum ammunition with this particular weight of bullet. There were different lot numbers of ammunition and fortunately the investigators and the shooting response team saved, secured examples of each agency's ammunition as well as what they were carrying in their belts and in their service revolvers. One agency was carrying Remington ammunition that was a little older than the other. So if I had a bullet that was badly damaged, and we expected them to be very damaged given this, the situation in this particular case, I could at least say the bullets with the step base were being carried by agency A. And the very otherwise same bullets, same powder, same weight, same kind of guns being carried by agency B had the plain base. Both have, of course, the scallop jacket and everything else the same. Let's go back to these bullets we just looked at. I've talked a lot about firing bullets, and yet I haven't shown you what they look like after they get fired. Here are three of our examples up above, a Lubaloy plated lead Winchester brand bullet on the upper left, um, a Federal bullet in the middle, a jacketed soft point bullet, and finally uh, our Remington bullet. All of these are the same weight, same caliber. Below is a fired bullet, so you can see that that thin copper plating, that Lubaloy finish, is very fragile and much of it gets rubbed or scuffed away during the discharge process. In fact, you can faintly see the vestiges of the land and groove or the rifling impressions on that bullet. They're much more conspicuous on the next two candidates because that's a, a fairly hard copper jacket. It's not nearly as fragile as that Lubaloy plating. And the Federal bullet shows very nice rifling engravings. We can see three land impressions on the bullet. The next one, the Remington bullet, is a little more difficult to see, but it's, it's clearly striated. It's clearly gone down a gun barrel, and of course, as you can see, it's expanded. It's expanded very nicely. It's expanded just the way the company intended it to, but we can still tell, with a little experience, that that was a scallop jacket. These petals have just rolled back very nicely, so we can still see their, their physical shape just in reverse, just turned inside out. Hey, let's bring, it in, bring a cartridge into the gun now. I've gone back in this illustration from the uh, Hand Loading Manufacturers Institute, a rifle cartridge, so we don't forget what a rifle cartridge looks like, a bottlenecked cartridge, but the mechanics are still the same. We've got a primer, center fire, it's about to be struck by the firing pin, flash hole allows the flame to go through and ignite the propellant charge, which we can see it looks like a bunch of sticks in there, or little particles and our jacketed soft point bullet. Microseconds later, after the discharge of that primer, the powder is ignited. It carries its own oxygen. The misconception is you don't need air inside the cartridge case. Nitrocellulose has its own oxygen supply. Think of it like a solid propellant rocket. There's a number of other things in there we're going to be interested in, but basically that solid propellant, which can be in a number of forms, creates heat and pressure, really after pressure, to force the bullet up the barrel where it engages the riflings, takes up the images of the riflings or the lands and grooves as they're called, and finally emerges from the muzzle with noise because of the expansion of gases which can be suppressed with suppressors uh, and sometimes with light and of course with a lot of residue that we're going to be very interested in uh, in a few moments. I've talked about propellants. The traditional propellants that are depicted in, uh, in Western movies and period pieces from the last century, from our Revolutionary War, were, was black powder. Black powder is a mechanical mixture of sulfur, sodium or potassium nitrate, and charcoal. If you get it wet, it comes out of solution and it's no good. On the right of this particular slide is what black powder looks like. It came in several granulations. This happens to be 3F granulation under a microscope. It simply looks like little pieces of coal. On the left is a new product, new within the last decade, called Pyrodex. And Pyrodex has the same thing black powder has in it, plus other constituents. It's changed its category as far as the DOT regulations. Uh, it's also got a different physical form, but from a firearms examiner's standpoint, it leaves different trace residues in the barrel of the gun and on the clothing of the shooter and the hands of the shooter and, of course, on, around uh, bullet holes and its physical appearance is quite different. You might think, well, black powder guns are something of the last century, as I, as I just said. 
There are companies making replicas of these firearms, and there can be accidents and have been accidents with uh, replica guns, and there have been very few, but there have been some, uh, criminal offenses carried out with black powder firearms. And I've personally worked three or four of those uh, myself. So distinguishing whether the residues are black powder or pyrodex is one of the first steps in that analysis. About the turn of the century, a new form of propellant came into existence, and that was the development of smokeless powders, made primarily either from wood meal or later cotton by nitrating it, so nitrocellulose as it came to be called. Now if we could see some nitrocellulose here today, it would basically look like a light amber uh, material. In the manufacturing process, it is soft and can be extru extruded through a thing called a spinneret, much like macaroni or spaghetti. So if we look at this next illustration, this is a contemporary nitrocellulose or smokeless propellant called tubular powder. The only reason it's gray is because it has a graphite coating to make it feed through the powdering measures more easily and of course to dissipate static charges in cartridge cases. But these little pieces of black macaroni have a central hole or perforation through them and that has to do with changing the burning characteristics of this solid fuel. Um, the length and diameter of these particles can vary, so there's a whole series of these tubular extruded propellants called the IMR series. They are primarily associated with rifle ammunition. We can take that same methodology, this extrusion of this nitrocellulose through a spinneret, and just set the cutter so it chops them in shorter pieces to the point we finally get a little disc. And we have two choices, a disc with a little hole in it or central perforation, such as you're seeing in this illustration, this is Alcan 120, a pistol powder um, that looks like a little gray disc with a hole in it. And that would be inside of, a, for example, a pistol cartridge. Um, after it's fired, some of these particles will not burn. In fact, that's true in every one of these examples I'm about to show you. Here's an example of a disc flake powder with no central perforation. This particular one happens to be known as Unique uh, it's a, with a capital U. It's a brand name. Uh, that's used by many hand loaders of pistol cartridges. In fact, close inspection of some of these particles, one can even see the tool marks of the cutter bar that shaved them or cut them as they were extruded through the spinneret. This form called lamelles, L-A-M-E-L-S, is one that's associated with European and Scandinavian manufacturers. No one in the U.S., to my knowledge, has ever made or makes now this physical form, again, of the same material, nitrocellulose. These lamelles take the form of little squares or diamonds. And again, some of these will survive discharge and show up as gunshot residue. Well, from what I've just told you, associated with European or Scandinavian ammunition can be a, a clue if we were to find such residues around a, a bullet wound or a gunshot injury. Another form of nitrocellulose came into existence in the 1930s, developed by Olin. What Olin did was take normal extruded tubular nitrocellulose and form it into a gelatinous mass in a colloidal suspension so it formed just like oil and water little balls hence the name ball powder and it too is gray or black because of the graphite coating they did something else with ball powder they incorporated another uh, constituent another explosive a true explosive in this case nitroglycerin but dissolved in nitrocellulose in certain percentages it doesn't explode it burns and that's an important distinction. All gunpowders burn, they don't explode. They have to or you'd burst the firearm. Ball powder can be truly spherical, such as this example, H870, again, a canister powder, a reloading powder. Occasionally you'll see a, an oval particle, but basically these are all spherical. Or it can be flattened. And here's BLC2, uh, again, a hand-loading powder where these spherical balls were passed between rollers and they were flattened slightly. That changes the burning characteristics and this is an important thing in the industry to match the available powder space with the bullet weight and the barrel length to get the right pressure curve and the right velocity without bursting the firearm or basically having a squib load, a bullet that goes part way up the barrel and stops. Another example of egregiously flattened ball powder, in fact the industry will often call this cracked ball, where the balls, the spherical balls have been so flattened that now they're basically flakes and they crack around the edges. In fact, there are a few members in here, if you hunt through them, uh, you can find these little checks or, or cracks in the edges. 
Uh, this particular one is Winchester 231 to the hand loaders out there. Again, the fundamental thing is we've got chemistry, nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin in double base powders, just nitrocellulose in single base powders, plus additives, graphite and deterrents, other coatings that survive the discharge process in some, some amount, some small amount, and end up in the barrel of the gun, in the chamber of the gun, in the fired cartridge cases, and on anything nearby. And by nearby, I'm typically talking in terms of a few inches, maybe a foot or so. And even the physical form that I've just described for you of some of these particles may survive and can be associated back with, again, ammunition, manufacturer, or some other trace evidence association with the responsible gun. Okay, I'm going to illustrate the difference, the, the characteristics in the way they burn and leave residues between smokeless propellants and, and the traditional black powder of the last century. And to do that, I've simply uh, stretched out a, a fine line here of smokeless powder. The one I particularly used in this case is unique, the disc flakes without the perforation you saw a moment ago, which lead up to a small charge of 3F uh, black powder. Now the 3F just has to do with the granulation size. Now what I'd like you to look for is the clean burning characteristics of the smokeless powder, the, the virtual lack of any smoke uh, and the amount of residue that will be left behind and then what occurs when we get to the, uh, the black powder. There's smokeless powder. And black powder. Now, the reason they both burn fairly slowly compared to a gunshot is that they were unconfined. There was nothing resisting the development of that heat and pressure. Put in a cartridge, they're both going to burn what seems like uh, an explosion. But looking at this, we have just an amber residue where the smokeless powder was located, and we have a lot of black soot where the black powder uh, burned, or deflagrated is the technical term. Now, let's bring all of that information together. You can look at this illustration, this drawing, where I've summarized the sources of, of particulates, of chemical constituents, of debris uh, that issue out of a firearm. This illustration gives us a top view of a revolver. Here with this Colt Python, I'm illustrating the same view we have in the drawing. We're looking down on the top of it. In a revolver, we've of course got a revolving cylinder. The cartridges, and these are dummy cartridges so the cameraman doesn't uh, totally uh, get upset with my pointing it at the audience. We can see that there are cartridges in these chambers. We've basically got a load indicator here in that we can see the cartridges in loaded chambers. But the point I also want to make is those projectiles, those bullets, when they're fired, have to get from this cylinder into the barrel. And to do that, they have to jump across an opening, an airspace. It's a very small one, but nonetheless, there's an area where they're unsupported and they're open to the outside. That's called the cylinder gap. And we will get a fan of gases, sometimes of light, and debris coming out of that cylinder gap. Some of it's bullet metal, some of it's powder residues, and those barium, lead, and antimony constituents I talked about earlier. Most of them, of course, that don't burn or are partially consumed are going to go out the muzzle. But the point of spending a fair moment here with you on cylinder gap is just this. Let's say I'm sitting in my car, I'm an assailant, and an officer comes up to write a ticket and I'm going to murder the man. If I'm holding the gun in a concealed position close to me like this, I'm going to have a scorch, a deposit of debris from the cylinder gap and some additional from the muzzle. And I've got two things here now to work with. I know the barrel length of the gun, even though I don't have the gun yet, from the separation between these two deposits. And I also know that I'm probably dealing with a revolver as opposed to a pistol or a semi-automatic, a firearm such as this, where there is no opening to the outside. The cartridge is in the chamber, which is integral with the barrel. The, the primary source of gunshot residues in a firearm of this design are here at the muzzle. Okay, let's go back to the uh, revolver situation uh, in the illustration that I'm now holding. I've got two places this material can come out. If, for example, we had this shoved in a pillow or a blanket or something trying to use it as a muffling or silencing device, we can even end up 
with patterns like this. And here this piece of uh, cotton was simply draped, not drawn taut, but simply draped over the revolver. And we end up with two scorches out each side, the top being shielded by the back strap. Another example of how we'd use that, an alleged accidental discharge in a holster. If the gun's truly down in the holster and it's a revolver, we're going to have two deposits and we'll know exactly whether the revolver was fully in the holster or not by where those cylinder gap deposits are located compared to the dimensions of the gun. Here's an example of a person's shorts uh, with two gunshot residue patterns on them and no bullet hole. We can see a faint one here near the top and a much more intense one down near the pant leg. The account in this situation was one of the gun slid off the bed or the seat of the pickup truck, hit the step, shot them in the foot. That clearly isn't the case. And if we look at the reconstruction of this shown in the slide where we have the gun juxtaposed alongside these patterns, you can see that the intense flash and soot material is from the muzzle. And the more subtle flash is from the cylinder gap and the blank spot in between is a representation of the barrel length of the gun. In this case, of course, we have the gun, so we already know that. But it does allow us to show the position of that firearm at the moment of discharge. And once again, we could do test firings to hold the gun a half an inch, an inch, two inches away from similar material and probably get down to within plus or minus an inch of the actual distance. It's certainly not over on the running board uh, of the truck when it's discharging. So there's a final example of gunshot residues in the horizontal plane rather than the straight on orientation and how they can be used to reconstruct the orientation, position, distance of the gun at moment of discharge. Okay, some additional illustrations of the value of gunshot residue. In this illustration, I've tried to summarize the fact that we've got particles. Some of them are bullet metal. We've got an aerosol of barium, antimony, and lead with American centerfire ammunition. We've got other materials and foreign ammunition, incidentally, that characterize it as such uh, that are different from what we see in American ammunition. We also have sooty material, uh, basically carbon, the material you saw on my fingers from the black gunpowder and even to a lesser extent from smokeless gunpowder. And these things come out of the muzzle of the gun much like a pattern of shot in miniature. The particles distribute themselves in somewhat of a conical fashion. As they go across distance, they lose energy and velocity, they spread out. The soot will have a point at which it cuts off and no longer leaves a deposit on clothing. Here are a couple of interesting examples that, that again, look at the difference between smokeless propellants in revolvers and black powder. The upper figure from one of the gun magazines shows us a revolver, which has that cylinder gap I've discussed, at the point before the bullet emerges from the muzzle but after it has crossed the cylinder gap. And if you look at that illustration in some detail, you'll see two flares of, of foggy-like material coming out of the cylinder gap. The lower picture of a fellow who specializes in black powder guns in one of the trade publications is shooting a black powder revolver, although you're hard-pressed to determine that because his hand and the gun are completely engulfed in black powder fouling. So if we had, to, had a way to control things, I'd really rather have shootings with black powder guns from a trace evidence standpoint or from a gunshot residue standpoint because they create massive amounts of it by comparison. Something else, if I had just fired this revolver and only fired it once, if it had been reasonably cleaned sometime in the past, cock it, fire it once, material coming out of the cylinder gap that you've already heard about on out the muzzle, that will create a smoky ring, sometimes called a flare or a halo, on the face of that particular chamber, the one that was under the hammer. That will tell me, or the way I would interpret that in the slide you may be now looking at, is this gun has been fired once since last cleaning. Something else, we've talked about a revolver and how the cylinder works. Let's say Here's my account. I'm talking to the police officers. I'm claiming it's an accident, that I was simply handling the gun. I didn't realize it was handed to me cocked. Uh, I'm unfamiliar with guns. I touched it, and it went off. All right, where is that fired chamber? I'm going to let go of the trigger. Nothing moved other than the hammer. The fired chamber in the cylinder is in line with the axis of the barrel. It's under the hammer. 
the investigator, if prints are not an issue, and they're not, I'm saying, I held the gun. No point in processing it for prints. I fired the gun, but I didn't mean to. All right, the astute investigator should take something like a Sharpie marking pen, something that is not going to deface the firearm. Even whiteout can be used and place a little tick mark on each side of the cylinder in the gun, on the gun, as found. Now, once we've got it documented, photographed, in place, marked the cylinder of a revolver, now we can open it up and look at where fired cartridges are. We'll talk about marking evidence a little more in diagrams, but my point is, look at the difference and look what happens if we get in, you officers out there get involved in this mad rush to secure the weapon. I actually shot the guy and I meant to. I just shot him. And he wasn't going down fast enough, so I thought about it again and, well, no, he drops to the floor. I just cycled that cylinder. If you missed it, run it back and take a look again. The fired cartridge is now one space over. The police are going to come. The neighbors heard the shot. I'm going to call it in as an accident. If I'm not thinking, and few criminals are, clearly, I'm going to let that hammer down and then either just drop the gun on the floor or set it down. If I rush in as an investigating officer, where's the gun, where's the gun, grab the gun up, get the cartridges out of it, I've lost that opportunity. I'll now never be able to confront that person in the lie, in the, in the fraud that he's perpetrated on us and, and we're doomed. The flare is that smoky residue that's created on a relatively clean gun from the discharge. And of course, if this example had been fired several times, we'd have overlapping flares. And we can actually see that at the laboratory with appropriate lighting, that one precedes the other. Or there may be a space between them where there's been a misfire. Let's go to automatics. They don't have cylinders that, that rotate. The cartridges are in the actual barrel where the firing is going to take place. So they don't have to jump across an airspace. But we still get substantial amounts of gunshot residue. In this remarkable photograph, also from one of the uh, popular gun magazines, is a semi-automatic pistol, not too different than the one I just showed you, where we can see the slide and barrel are still uh, forward. In other words, it's still in battery, as the armor would say. We've got a little bit of flash, a cloud of sooty material that's going to get much bigger in the next few microseconds. And although it's not clearly apparent, the bullet is actually in this cloud of debris. It's right at the leading uh, forward end uh, of the discharge. Now this may be a little hard to understand or see at first, but you're looking at a highly magnified picture that I took years ago in the crime laboratory uh, through the microscope looking right down inside the gun barrel. And this illustrates, again, an important point about the powder particles and their physical form themselves. You're looking at a particle of unburned ball gunpowder adhering to the interior, the bore of the gun in a pistol that's been fired. That's historical information. The last shot, if there were more than one, the last shot fired in that pistol was with a cartridge loaded with ball powder. Here's a quick another example. Let's say we have a barroom shooting, two subjects, both armed with, this happened to be a, a 380 automatic, both armed with 380 automatics. One's shooting Winchester ammunition, one's shooting Remington ammunition. They both admit shooting their guns toward the decedent. In the, to the extent that one was going to frighten him by firing off to one side, the other was going to do the same, but apparently screwed up because the man's got a shot right through him. But there's my point. It goes all the way through. The bullet's never to be found. If we've got gunshot residues on the clothing, we can say, well, Remington has disc flake powder in it by way of an example, and we know that because the cartridges are on the floor. Those can be matched back to the gun in a semi-automatic quite easily. The other man has fired Winchester cartridges and some ball powder residues in the bore of his pistol. With the population of two, it has to be A or B. Even though we don't have a bullet, but we've got residues, I can tell you who fired that shot. It's the man with the cartridges loaded with ball powder. And you can play that scenario other ways. But just imagine what will happen if this gun is picked up with a pencil stuck in the muzzle as depicted on television that singular particle of powder is history. We'll never see it again. And we're now precluded. We can still match cartridges to the guns, but we've got to establish which gun caused the injury. Powder 
particles from those physical forms I just showed you can also express themselves right in the base of the very bullet. Earlier I showed you some full metal jacketed bullets with exposed lead bases. In some combinations of powder and full metal jacketed bullets, the powder particles will actually print their image in the base of the bullet. And here's an example from an actual case. This is still an unsolved case, incidentally, of a long distance shooting with a 30M1 carbine. And you're looking at a split view through a comparison microscope. In the top view is the bullet with little imprints of the type of propellant that propelled that bullet. And this was unique because 30M1 carbine ammunition by manufacturers has never been loaded that I could ever determine with this type of propellant. But one commercial hand loader in Phoenix, Arizona loaded 600 rounds of this ammunition and sold it to six different people. So in all likelihood, there's our investigative leads. We got six hot contenders out there that bought 100 rounds each of what most likely was the very ammunition used in this shooting. The bullet was made by Hornaday, the propellant by, Remy, by DuPont, and it was uh, 4227, as I recall, for the hand loaders out there. And several of these, this is the type of extruded powder that's a little short uh, spaghetti or macaroni pieces that have the central perforation. Some of those actually can be seen in the base of this bullet. And we could go through this same scenario with the lamelles, the little diamonds or squares, disc flake, and so on, and see this in some instances. The residues at the muzzle. Here's a piece of cotton, a typical witness panel material that's used by criminalists and firearms examiners where we will set the distance, and I'll use myself again as a model, where we'll set the distance with a machine rest or a ransom rest between the material and if this jacket were shot, I'd ultimately use other pieces of the jacket and pick distances, two inches, four inches, six inches, and so on, and actually fire patterns, such as the, the ones I'm about to show you, and compare those with the actual evidence pattern. And typically, if we've got a pattern, it's telling us already that we're dealing with fairly close proximity discharge, a few inches or feet. And by the intensity and diameter and the distribution of powder particles in that pattern, we can typically set a standoff or separation distance within plus or minus a couple of inches. And that's very useful, even if you think that's a serious error. If the issue is I shot him from some distance or he was coming at me and we were struggling over the gun and I jerked back and it fired, it's the difference between inches and three or four feet. And that's easily reconcilable and resolvable by this kind of testing. I'll just run through a couple so you can get the idea of how these change as the distance increases. Very close, we're going to have a lot of soot and the powder particles are going to be intensely co-located around the bullet hole. As we back off, that sooty cloud, because it's very light in its density and, and the weight and the energy of those particles, dissipates and loses its velocity. So it's just going to start leaving a very faint deposit as we get out to, well, typically four, five, six inches and so on. The powder particles, the unburned particles and those various physical forms we talked about, the example I gave you earlier was like shot in miniature, little particles going out in a conical distribution. Those will impinge upon skin, and if it's close enough, they'll go right into skin. That's called stippling. If it's on clothing, they'll stick into, sometimes perforate the first layer and be found in the second. But they will also be deposited on the first layer. And careful handling, of course, is important so the investigators don't dislodge them. But if that's done, then we now start looking at a pattern of powder particles and less and less soot. So in this depiction, you've got mostly powder particles distributed over about a five or six inch diameter. And if we go in very close, this is a, a photomicrograph, we can see the bullet hole. And again, if your resolution on your camera is very good or your, your television, you can spot some of these as disc flake particles. Now they look yellow instead of gray because that graphite coating has burned away but the physical form is still still there. I talked about, or I mentioned the bullet hole. You might notice a faint smudged ring around the bullet hole. That's what we'll ultimately end up with at great distance. It's called bullet wiping. Even in a clean bore, if I scrupulously clean this Colt Python or this 45 automatic here today, so that bore was mirror clean with a dry patch and fired a bullet through it, some of the gases will sneak by that bullet There'll be some abrasion, some galling of the bullet metal against the steel barrel. And between those two sources, we'll still end up with a faint ring around an entry hole. That's called bullet wipe. Of course, it's even more prevalent uh, with a fouled bore. 
But that's useful for several reasons. It can tell us that the hole really is a bullet hole. I mean, there may be a bunch of holes in a t-shirt or a curtain hanging in a room that, that look promising as bullet holes. The bullet wipe will resolve that. That's one way to do it. That bullet wipe has lead in it from the priming composition, the lead stiffnate, even though a copper jacketed bullet may have been used. And where copper jacketed bullets are used, there's also copper in that material. And there are chemical tests uh, that I'll show you in just a moment that can be used, a very simple technique, to develop out the traces of copper and the traces of lead in a suspect hole, in a hole we think may be a bullet hole, but we want to confirm. In the case of synthetic fibers, polyester and nylon, for example, the passage of the bullet will actually melt the ends of the fibers, and those can be examined under a polarizing microscope and verified as a bullet hole if, for example, this garment went through the laundry and were washed or laid out in the rain for weeks or months before a body were found. There's another way to verify the hole as being a bullet hole. It also tells us direction. In this view, I finally zoomed in about as close as I can with the microscope I was using that day, and we can see the disruption of fibers, a uh, pretty nice bullet wipe along the bottom of this bullet hole, and again, identifiable particles of disc flake powder without a central perforation. So now I know a lot about the ammunition that fired this particular bullet insofar as the kind of propellant. I mentioned uh, bullet holes through cloth and wiping, and the description I gave you was a person with clothing. You might think, well, that occurs simply because of the resistance of skin or muscle or something behind it. One will get bullet wipe even with free hanging cloth, so a curtain, and that's the illustration I'm giving you here. These pieces of cloth were hung just free hanging off of a hanger, oh, about a foot apart or so. And the point here is the first cloth to be perforated is the one that will have the predominant, if not all, the bullet wipe on it. Anything after that, just like the name suggests, it's been wiped off the bullet. So now we can not only establish direction of entry, but sequence by the presence or absence of bullet wipe. And this illustration was an example where a total metal jacketed bullet shown here, in other words, it has no lead on it, uh, exposed, just copper, was fired through this piece of cotton and then another piece uh, about a foot away. This is a shot, as I just described to you, a clean bore shot with a 9 millimeter full metal jacketed bullet. And here again, in this bullet hole, number one is the clean bore shot with very obvious bullet wiping around it. And the description of the ammunition and so forth is there for those who are, who are interested in that sort of thing. Now this probably unexciting slide is the test for copper. The test for copper is called a dithiooxamide test. And it's done by a transfer technique of simply taking a moistened piece of filter paper with a dilute ammonia solution, pressing it against the putative bullet hole, pulling it away, spraying it with a reagent called dithiooxamide, which is specific for copper. It forms this sort of dingy gray green reaction product. The dot was simply a way for me to locate where the hole was before I lifted this away. A more useful and interesting test is the sodium rhodesinate test for lead. So I've got a choice, I can, or I can do both of them. If both are going to be done, the copper test, the dithiooxamide test, must be done first, then the sodium rhodesinate test for lead. And this test is useful in other ways, the, this test being the one for lead, because it picks up the lead from the primer, it picks up lead smudged on the bullet, such as you're looking at here, uh, from just the wiping, and of course, if there's this aerosol of lead that's deposited at very close range on clothing, we can develop it out again by a transfer technique uh, with filter paper, and it's lasting. We haven't destroyed anything. We simply, like raising a fingerprint, developed a print of the gun's discharge products off of the clothing. I want to stop now and consolidate how firearms work in combination with the ammunition that's made for them. And we'll recall we have two basic types of metallic cartridges, rimfire cartridges, the 22 rimfires in short, long and long rifle, and then center fire cartridges with the primer in the center portion of the case. And I'm holding here some center fire cartridges for revolvers, semi-automatic pistols, and rifle cartridges. The last two customarily will be a long cartridge with a long pointed bullet. One of these is a tapered cartridge, the other a bottleneck cartridge. Let's start with uh, some common, a common 22 that probably many of us shot as a child, a bolt action rifle. The magazine to hold the cartridges is often a tubular affair under the barrel, 
and the area I've opened now is the area where the cartridges, the 22 rimfire cartridges, would be inserted. Many of these guns will handle all three, the short, long, or long rifle. Some are simply chambered for 22 long rifle, the longer cartridge. They would then be fed by working the bolt out of that magazine, up into the action, and then by pushing the bolt forward, loaded into battery or into the chamber, bolt locked, closed, and depending upon design uh, or where the safety is, we may have a safety to disengage and fired. The bolt face has an extractor, a piece that will pull the fired cartridge out of the uh, chamber. That will leave, often leave a mark on that rim, <clears throat> on the rim that I discussed earlier. There will also be a piece called an ejector. This is some sort of metal fixture that must strike the cartridge and knock it clear of the mechanism so that we can load the next round into the chamber. Another common design, in this case happens to be in a center fire rifle format, is a lever action gun. Again, we pull an ammunition supply from some source, in this case a magazine that's built into the action of the gun. Cartridges are brought up by operating the lever and again, some sort of breech block, something that will hold the cartridge in the chamber and prevent it from blowing itself out of the chamber, secures it. And that area will again have to have some sort of extractor to pull that cartridge out, an area where marks will be left, some sort of ejector to knock the fired cartridge clear, and of course a firing pin to discharge it. And the firing pin striking either the rim of a rim-fired cartridge or the primer in the central location of a center-fire cartridge. Okay. For the next example, a pump gun, uh, I have a shotgun, although it could be a rifle. There are a number of rifle cartridges chambered or designed to work in this fashion. And in most any police uh, action picture, we've seen some kind of a pump shotgun. But the principles are the same, a breech block to hold the cartridge in place, an extractor and ejector to remove it and to knock it clear of the mechanism. And in this case, we've again got a tubular magazine under the barrel of the gun to hold the ammunition supply. We could, of course, have a single-shot firearm where there is no magazine, um, but that's fairly logical. Now here's a semi-automatic uh, rifle uh, made by Ruger, very similar, uh, in fact, it's called a Mini-14 to an M-14 in the military, and it has something a little different, a detachable box magazine. Call it a clip if you like, but I won't. It should be called a magazine. The ammunition inserted here, forced upward by spring tension, and like the other firearms I've just illustrated, will be fed into the mechanism as the bolt is allowed to go forward. And in this case, since it's semi-automatic, each firing or each pull of the trigger will cause the mechanism to cycle um, by one of several means, in this case uh, by gas, check the fired cartridge and load the next one in. As long as we have ammunition, we can keep firing until the ammunition supply is exhausted. There's another type of firearm that occurs in both handguns or pistols and shotguns called a break open design. And in this type of design the cartridges are inserted manually and after firing or even before if you wish to unload the piece it's broken open and the cartridges extracted. These of course being dummy cartridges. This is useful to talk about briefly because there will be marks oftentimes left by the firing pins dragging across these cartridges once we open the gun up. So finding such a cartridge at a scene with a firing pin scrape or drag mark tells me much about the mechanism. If you go back and look at every mechanism I've shown you, they work in a reciprocating fashion, forward and back. Here we've got something that breaks open, just like the name suggests, a break open. A drag mark will only occur in that kind of format. So I've, I've got a clue the minute I see that, and that's something you can see right at the crime scene with, with good close-up vision. Long before I have the gun, I have something that tells me basically what I'm looking for and by way of the design of the gun. Let's look at some handguns, things that we usually encounter more often than long guns, and review. A revolver with its cylinder. Now this is a swing out design, a typical police type firearm, a contemporary firearm. The cartridges, and again these are dummy cartridges today, and I'll just take a couple are loaded into the chamber, you've already seen that, but they're secured there, held there, by a rim. And the way I know that and the way I can tell that is I can look at it for one, but you can feel the extended rim on a rimmed cartridge. Rimmed cartridges are rimmed 
because they're designed or originally intended for revolvers. If we didn't have that rim, the cartridge would just continue to go on down into the chamber. This is again useful because the design, whether it's rimmed or rimless, of a fired cartridge tells me something about the kind of mechanism uh, that it uses. So here's four rounds, dummy rounds, loaded into a swing out cylinder revolver. Now we've got two ways to fire this type of gun. We've got what's called double action, and although it may seem single at first, it's really double, and I'll explain why. This is double action discharge. Pulling the trigger accomplishes two things. It cocks and discharges the pistol. Really, you might even say three things. It also revolves or rotates the cylinder. Single action would be a situation where I've at some point cocked the piece, and now pulling the trigger accomplishes the single act of firing it. Hammer falls. Again, single action would be like this. Double action, like that. Some revolvers, and some pistols for that matter, are strictly single action. That is, you have to cock the hammer back, some external hammer to fire it. Others are like this, you have an option. From the prosecutor or any attorney's standpoint, doing this, readying the gun in single action, they would argue is a premeditated act. I, I tend to agree. You have to think about that. It doesn't happen automatically. Now we may have other guns that are double action or even single action, but that do not have an external hammer. Here's an example of a little inexpensive 25 automatic pistol cartridge. And you'll see there's no hammer on this firearm. And right now, although I've checked it, of course, you as an observer or a detective wouldn't be able to tell if it's loaded. We can remove the magazine, and I've done that, not the clip, and see that there are no cartridges in it, but let's assume there are some cartridges in it. I still don't know that it's necessarily unloaded, and this has been a popular defense in many cases. The person took the magazine out and assumed the pistol was unloaded, but there easily could be a cartridge in the chamber. Some firearms will have a load indicator. This one does not. So I'd have to then retract the slide, this piece that I've just moved, to allow the extractor to work and pull any cartridge that's in there out. Looking at it from sort of the other way, the internal mechanism in this gun is not a hammer, but rather a thing called a striker, basically just like a nail or a pin that's under spring tension. It's now been cocked. So if I load this pistol, with the exception of activating some sort of safety, it's ready to fire. I don't have to cock anything. And it does not have what's called a magazine safety. Some firearms will have a safety mechanism that if you remove the magazine, it can't be fired. These features are all of interest and importance in reconstructing or evaluating a defendant or an arrestee's claim, particularly in alleged accidental shooting cases. Occasionally it may be true, but the features of how the gun work is, works, of how guns work, are not something I expect every detective or officer to know. In fact, I don't know how every gun works, but something that once it's documented, photographed, and properly collected can later be evaluated if we have an account or an explanation gone up a little bit in caliber in this pistol. Again, we've got a slide in this semi-automatic pistol. We've got an external hammer that we can see that would be cocked if I worked the slide and loaded the gun, or I could manually cock it. And then again, it's of course unloaded. This does not have a magazine safety, so if, if I had a round in the chamber, even though I had no magazine in it, it could be fired. And this gun has a double action capability that the last pistol did not. Again, by that I mean, notice that the hammer is down, but I can simply reach in, pull the trigger, and like the revolver I showed you, fire this gun for the first shot. When that fires, the action of the powder gases will drive this slide back, eject the fired cartridge. Under spring tension, it will fly forward. The hammer is now cocked, and if we had a magazine with ammunition in it, we've got another round in the chamber, and since it's semi-automatic, I have to let go of the trigger just enough to allow a thing called the disconnector to function. Now I can fire it. So I could keep doing this uh, as long as the ammunition supply lasted. We've talked about the cylinder gap in a revolver and how the bullets must jump across that opening and how the cartridges are held in there. I now want to look at a, another semi-automatic pistol, a government Colt 45 automatic. And I've removed the barrel from a like gun, so you can see the distinction I talked about earlier. And this will become useful in a moment when we look at the markings on bullets. Here's a barrel out of a government Colt 45 automatic, and here's a cartridge for it. No revolver or no cylinder, but rather 
the chamber is machined into and a part of the actual barrel. So this cartridge goes in and it finds its seat, headspace being the technical term, but finds its proper position simply by running up against a shoulder or a little recess cut out inside the chamber here at the mouth of the cartridge where the bullet and the cartridge meet, not a rim. So this is a rimless cartridge and rimless cartridges typically are associated with semi-automatics and submachine guns. I reiterate, reiterate by virtue of the fact that they find their position right in the actual firing chamber and barrel, which are integral, uh, on a small step, not by being held at the rim. Semi-automatics uh, have two general formats that we might see besides the mechanism. We may have single action or double action design, but at this point I've got the slide locked back and you can see the barrel. But in the normal shooting position, the barrel is concealed uh, inside the slide, this piece here. There are some semi-automatics that if you have astute witnesses and you're interviewing them, may have noticed a distinction. Here in this Beretta pistol, here's the barrel, and we can see that when the slide is closed, we can still see the barrel, so it's an exposed barrel. Other examples would be the, the classic German Luger, and the Walther P-38, which have exposed barrels. Everything I've told you is insofar as those two distinctions can also be seen in 22 semi-automatic uh, pistols. So even if it's not a witness, if we've got a bank camera, something like that where we can improve the image on the uh, video camera, we might be able to, to see some features of these guns that would allow us to say that the hold-up man was carrying either a gun of this type uh, or of the, the Colt uh, semi-automatic. Now we've got the cartridges being held in the gun by one of basically two ways, a rim in a revolver on the neck or mouth of the cartridge in a semi-automatic, marks being left as those cartridges are loaded into the gun by really several sources, the first one being the magazine itself. Here's a magazine out of that government Colt 45 automatic. These lips on the magazine are preventing this cartridge from simply flying out toward you as a viewer. That slide as it came back and now goes forward will catch the back of this cartridge just as my thumb is and instead of plopping it out on the floor it's going to of course navigate its way up into the chamber of the gun, into the barrel I just held up a moment ago. But in so doing there may be two drag marks cut into the cartridge case by the lips of this magazine, particularly if it's not well made or well finished. Now, that doesn't say the cartridge was fired in that particular gun, in fact it's an expression or a statement of the magazine it came from. But it could be and has been used to say or identify or establish that the cartridges found at the scene were stripped from this particular magazine, if we can identify those marks. Now as this cartridge goes into battery, as the armor would say, like that, there's a breech block that's pushing against it, there is an extractor that has come up over, snapped into this groove, that stands to leave several marks as it impacts the rim, goes up and over and snaps down into the groove. We stand to have three marks made by one piece of metal, the, ex the extractor at that point. When this fires, we have a firing pin that imprints its image into that center fire primer that we talked about. We now have pressures going up in the area of 30,000, even 40,000 pounds per square inch in some handguns, and of course more in a rifle. That's thrusting that cartridge back against the breech face of the gun. The tool marks, the finishing features on the breech face of the responsible gun are going to print their image right in the primer and in, often in the head of the cartridge where the written information is we saw earlier. So now we've got pressures up in the 30,000 pounds per square inch. The bullet has now moved perhaps an inch or so up the barrel. This transference of information is taking place between firing pin and breech face. We've already got some earlier tool marks on the cartridge case. Now the cartridge is either basically blown out of the chamber in a simple blowback design or it's pulled out of the chamber in a locked breech design such as we're looking at here. In either regard, there's going to come a point where the ejector, this small piece of metal, strikes that cartridge in most guns it's going to be down around the seven or eight o'clock position from your viewpoint strike it and knock that empty cartridge out and off to the shooter's right sometimes upward sometimes also rearward but it must come out 
can be cleared of the mechanism through this area, the ejection port. So imagine in your mind's eye a live cartridge in this gun, a hammer's cocked, this gun fires in a single action mode, firing pin just struck the primer, tool marks, pressures go up, new tool marks, slide starts moving rearward, rearward. and in this gun, which is a locked breech design, notice as I push this back that what you can see of the barrel and the slide move together for a short distance. Now the barrel, through a linking mechanism, is pulled down, literally jerked down. If that firing pin is still sticking slightly into the fired primer, there will now be a scrape mark, much like the break open shotgun I showed you earlier. There's also already been this transference of tool marks. I covered that. The slide continues back by the a thrust given to it by the discharge of the cartridge and the recoil of this mechanism, it'll finally come to a point where that fired cartridge is struck by that ejector, a small piece of metal, and knocked out again toward you, the viewer. The firing will reciprocate, it's already recocked itself, and load another round in a battery if indeed there's ammunition in the magazine. Now what happens to the bullet? It's being pushed up the barrel by uh, in the human sense of things, tremendous pressures. And in that barrel have to be machined a certain number of spiral grooves and a certain rate of rotation, or twist as it's called. And the illustration I now have uh, up simply shows us uh, a stylized view looking down a gun barrel of a gun that has six lands and grooves. The public would normally call them riflings. The lands in this illustration are white and the grooves are red. Grooves are just what the name suggests. They're grooves that are either cut by a scrape cutter method or a brooch, or they can be formed into a gun barrel by a forging process or a swedging process. Time doesn't allow to go into all the methods of rifling, but the important thing is that there's great variety out there in rifling numbers of riflings. And of course, we have two choices of direction of twist. You're now looking at a right twist. Well, how do we define that? Well, note at the top of any barrel you're looking down. And imagine yourself journeying down that barrel. It's not the twilight zone, but uh, notice whether in your mind's eye you're rolling off to the right. If you are, it's a right-hand twist. And if in your mental journey down that gun barrel you roll off toward the left as thinking about the top up at 12 o'clock, then it's a left-hand twist. Why they didn't name it clockwise and counterclockwise, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. But keep this in your thoughts for just a moment, we'll go to a left twist with the same number of lands and grooves. Of course, you've probably figured out I've simply turned the slide around. But this will give you the idea. Now, does it matter which end of a gun barrel we look down? Well, it's not as, as easy to do on a video camera, but I can show you one way to prove to yourself it doesn't matter. This simple little straw has a left twist. If you're looking at one of the land impressions or grooves, we can call it either one for that matter, in red, and as it goes away from you, that's off to the left. I'm going to take this straw, turn it over. You still get the same answer. So there have been many arguments about this, but it doesn't matter. If you look down the business end of a barrel of a gun to figure out the land and some grooves and more importantly the direction of twist, or if you have a way of looking through the breech end. Well, you think, well, why not always look through the safe end? Well, obviously, we're going to make sure the gun is unloaded. But, for example, with this revolver, if I'm going to, out in the field or in the laboratory, count the number of lands and grooves and direction of twist, I can't look at it from this direction. I've got to look at it this way. And this can be done at crime scenes, and I have trained officers who are interested in doing this, and they're quite capable of doing it. It's a judgment, an evaluation with the human eye. You can simply backlight the bore with just your thumbnail or a small piece of paper. And I can determine this is six, six left, just that quick. It's also clean. In other words, it hasn't been fired since last cleaning. With barrels that can be removed, or if this were a rifle instead of a shotgun, since shotguns are smooth bore, fine. Then I can simply open the gun up, remove the cartridge, and look through this way. But the key thing is, Direction of twist determination doesn't matter. Next trick is counting. And there's one other aspect of lands and grooves that's of value. In this uh, seemingly technical drawing, manufacturers have a choice of how many grooves they cut in a gun barrel. They could cut as little as, suppose they could cut as little as one. But 
in actuality, a minimum of two have been used in, in fact, a very famous rifle, a Springfield rifle in the First World War. They could cut three. Some Civil War rifles had three lands and grooves. But more commonly, four, five, six, fairly uncommon, seven, very common, eight, and then some on up to as many as 22 lands and grooves in microgroove systems. But in this illustration, you can see that if you cut a groove or two, what's left behind is a land, is the raised area, or the rifling, if you wish to call it that. If you cut a groove very, very wide, then the remaining land will be very, very narrow. If you cut a groove very narrow, the remaining lands will be quite wide. So now we have quite a profusion of choices here. Direction of twist, we just got two. But the number, as little as two, as many as 22. How wide they are, or how narrow, is at, well, I hesitate to say whim, but at the choice of the manufacturer or the engineers. All of that is expressed on the fired bullet, and all of that is useful for setting the choices as to what kind of firearm could have fired this bullet. These are often called a no-gun case. The FBI laboratory and most criminalists, myself included, have a complete listing of all the known rifling characteristics by caliber, direction of twist, number, and the dimensions. So in such a situation, if you have a recovered bullet and no gun yet, uh, the criminalist or firearms examiner from examining the number, the direction of twist, and the widths of these lands and grooves can compile you a list of the guns that could have fired that bullet. Sometimes the list is fairly lengthy if it were 10 right, for, I'm sorry, 6 right, for example, in 22, very common. But if it were 7 right in 380 automatic, at the present time there's only one gun in the world that's ever been rifled that way. So that would be a real coup of your laboratory to tell you and send you a picture of the very gun you're looking for and have the detectives or field officers recover it later. This illustration simply, again, is a diagrammatic illustration of our choices of right or left twist and number of lands and grooves. We've got a four right at the top left, a five right, a six right, and going across the bottom, the only left twist gun in here, a six left. And I might uh, parenthetically add that that has been a popular system of Colt. It's not unique to Colt, but with rare exception, Colt has always used six left in their rifling. The five right, the upper middle, has traditionally been used by Smith & Wesson. And with very rare exception, if someone's rebarreled a Smith, perhaps there'll be something else. But how would you use that information? Two officers in a officer-involved shooting, one's got a Smith, one's got a Colt. The bullets are mutilated by hitting brick walls and cars and things beyond identification capabilities. And if you settle for a laboratory answer that says the bullets are unsuitable for identification, you're not communicating well and you're not thinking. Both of you are not communicating well because the question or matter should be, well, if one's got X and one's got Y, one's got a Smith, one's got a Colt, can you at least tell us the general rifling characteristics on the bullet or bullet fragments? If we can only tell twist, the direction of twist on the bullet fragments, we've still got that one solved very easily just on that. Well, let's look at sort of the real world. I've given you a couple of drawings. This is a cutaway of an actual gun barrel. And we can look down in there, hopefully, and see one of the riflings, one of the lands or grooves, uh, and on each side of that, the counterpart. You can also see a lot of rough tool marks left in there from the rotary reaming that was carried out to make this gun barrel. It is those features, the rough marks caused by the manufacturing process, the galling of metal, chip formation, and then later, use, abuse, normal wear, shooting bullets through the barrel that are dusty or dirty, that give that barrel its unique characteristics that basically, I hesitate to use the word fingerprint, but that's been popularized, fingerprint that bullet back to that gun, as long as we can find corresponding areas that survive damage. This illustration tells us or shows how to determine direction of twist on the bullets. Now, I talked about the barrels. If you imagine again in your mind's eye, you've got a barrel that's transparent. Go back to that instruction I gave you of concerning yourself with the top portion of the barrel as you look into it. Imagine now you're above that barrel or above that soda straw I used a moment ago looking through this transparent barrel which now has a bullet in it. So that rifling that moved off to the left for a left hand twist now leaves a mark that does the very same thing and once again upper left illustration doesn't matter whether we point the bullet toward our belly button or away from us as long as we look down on the bullet and ask ourselves as this land or groove impression, pick either one, goes away from us, does it go off toward my left hand or my right hand? And this one's, of course, a left hand twist. 
Again, you might think that's all laboratory stuff, but I want you to understand that every criminalist or firearms examiner carries out his initial examinations, many of them, simply with the unaided eye. So this is an acquired skill that many police investigators have mastered, and it doesn't take a lot of work. It merely amounts to getting a small collection of bullets of known characteristics to practice on. And why should you be doing it in the field or be capable of doing it in the field? Because you may be looking for two guns or three guns instead of one. If you see all full metal jacketed 45 automatic bullets splattered around a crime scene, your initial visceral reaction is we're probably dealing with one gun. But if you picked up a couple of those and discovered that some of them have left twist engravings on them and some right, even if you didn't count the number, you've got two guns out there. And when a citizen or somebody comes up with a gun they found in a trash dumpster, it's not all over. It's half over. You've still got another gun. If you can't do that at the scene, and if you don't know this already, crime laboratories typically have a turnaround time of weeks to months. And by now, that other dumpster uh, has emptied, and the other gun you're looking for, the one that's probably the fatal gun, is history. Other illustrations uh, show something called a revolver skid, number four in this drawing. I spent a fair amount of time talking about how revolvers are made and this jump that the bullet has to make from the chamber into the forcing cone or the beginning of the barrel. In so doing, it very seldom perfectly aligns with the riflings in the barrel. In that automatic where I held up that chrome-plated barrel from a 45, that bullet starts out right up against the riflings. It doesn't have anything to jump across. So it's going to be perfectly aligned and, in, and engage the rifling true and straight. A revolver bullet or a bullet fired through a revolver seldom does around its entire circumference. And a careful discerning eye uh, with a hand magnifier, sometimes just visually, can pick up what's often referred to as a revolver skid. This is a momentary gripping of the bullet, engagement of the riflings, and then a recentering as it sort of settles in and moves another quarter inch or so up the barrel. And a retracking, sort of like backing your car up in the snow and then moving forward again to, to make a slight doublet of a track. A characteristic of a revolver. There's also some characteristics about the bullets that are used in revolvers I've talked about. Combining those two, if I were at one of your scenes and picked up such a bullet, I'd probably word it this way. The likelihood is, given this revolver skid or these skid marks and a lead cantaloured bullet, we're looking for a revolver. Very unlikely that we're looking for a semi-automatic. And people beating the bushes looking for an ejected cartridge casing are probably wasting their time. Now, there's something else we can do at a scene that's field expedient and very easy. If we've got different types of ammunition, and we've seen a great variety of ammunition in the same caliber and cartridge designation uh, involved in a case, we could have one gun shooting multiple types of uh, projectiles. We can do a base-to-base -base comparison by very carefully juxtaposing two recovered bullets and seeing if we can phase them, if we can line up the land and groove impressions. Uh, that's also shown in an illustration, but if you recall, it doesn't matter whether we look at it front to back or back to front. If indeed we have one firearm, one gun involved, we will be able to, to phase the land and groove impressions, both in their direction of twist and in their uh, spatial relationship, their widths. In other words, it'll look like a continuum engraved the marks across these two bullets. On the other hand, we could either have people sharing ammunition with two different guns or Combine them both. Different ammunition, two different guns in the same caliber. A uh, Colt 45 automatic and a SIG 45 automatic or some similar arrangement. The Beretta and a Smith & Wesson. And there, this sort of base-to-base -base comparison, just carefully bringing the two bullets near, not grinding them into each other, would quickly reveal uh, a difference in land and groove count. We wouldn't even have to count them. We'd simply see that we can't phase the two, that we've got some sort of mismatch here. And once again, the importance is the investigator right there that night is alerted that he has at least two guns in this last situation. Here's some actual bullets. We've looked at drawings, but actual bullets enlarged where we can look at this kind of comparison. On the left, we've got two, they happen to be Federal brand, uh, 357 Magnum bullets we've seen several times before. A base to base, both of these uh, were fired either from the same gun or from a gun with the same general rifling characteristics. Which way is the twist? It's a right twist. The two in the middle have substantially more lands and grooves. There's 
as I recall, 12 in this particular gun. This does happen to be, because I fired them, the very same gun, but two very different bullets. A silver tip round by Winchester on the top and 147 grain subsonic bullet below. But we can phase them, just as we did the two on the left. Now here's a mismatch on the far right. We've got a Winchester jacketed hollow point bullet above that started to expand, but more importantly, it's a left-hand twist. Take a look at it. The rifling engravings go off to your left, whereas the lead three cantilevered bullet down below has very wide land and groove impressions, distinction number one. And secondly, they're off to the right. So we have a left twist and a right twist gun. We've got to have two guns and, of course, two different types of ammunition, even though they're both uh, 38 caliber or 357 magnum caliber. And I think the last example I'll give you is how subtle uh, rifling engravings can be with one new type of, uh, of product on the market called the polygonal rifling system. This is being used by the West Germans, now just the Germans, I suppose, uh, Heckler and Koch, for example, um, and Glock. The particular bullet on the right was fired from a Heckler and Koch 9mm. The type of bullets, full metal jacketed, uncantilevered, are the same in both of these, but there are virtually no discernible rifling engravings on the bullet from the polygonal rifling system. That in itself becomes a nearly unique characteristic. The one on the left has clear land and groove impressions, and again, this is a quiz. Right or left twist? Right twist. Firing pin impressions. I've talked again about uh, the firing pin leaving some marks in rimfire cartridges. In the examples in the upper row, we've got everything from flat, round firing pin impressions to hemispherical to square to rectangular. Uh, and even some I haven't shown you. Uh, earlier, I believe I gave you a triangular one. Those are all characteristic of the company that made the gun, and they will usually be consistent for a particular make and model for year after year. So that be can become a useful characteristic in compiling you a list of possible guns that fired a cartridge before we ever have the gun. The shapes of the firing pins are shown in the lower figure. It gives you simply a profile view, so you've got some idea of how these things are going to leave an imprint, whether it's a rimfire cartridge, or a center fire cartridge. The breech faces of the guns that, that hold these cartridges in place, whether it's a rifle, a pistol, or a shotgun, uh, and the marks that transfer during firing uh, are the next item of interest. I've shown you here in this illustration three different styles of breech face um, design or finishing. The upper one that I'd simply have called a Colt type, we have a gun like that here. And that has been finished by the manufacturer simply by going in here with a milling machine and milling and finishing the surface of that breech face with a vertical milling or filing tool. What that, of course, leaves on this flat breech face is just that, tool marks, faint vestiges of an array of tool marks that go from top to bottom. On the other hand, certain other guns, like a Luger, or a P-38, both from the Second World War and 9mm, have the breech face recess where a tool has gone in there with rotary motion and cut out metal. So we could, and there are, have guns all in 9mm, all shooting the very same brand and loading of ammunition, but because one has a recessed breech face, and the only way you can do that is with a rotary milling tool, that will print circular tool marks in the primer of the fired cartridge. The Colt type design is going to leave parallel tool marks on these fired 9mm cartridges. And finally, we have where the extractor and ejector are located in these three guns that also will leave a little gouge in the rim where the extractor rides over, will leave a little ding mark in the cartridge case where the ejector strikes it. And I reiterate, this is something that is not heavy science. It's simply observational, and it's a skill that one can do, and many investigators do do, right in the field. So in this illustration, I've given you the style of the breech faces of these three guns and what the cartridges from them would look like. So a quick example, and we'll go on. Three 9mm cartridges by Federal. One of them has circular tool marks imprinted in the primer, and the other two have parallel or vertical. Now, I'm not prepared to say we're looking for a Colt and a Luger at that point, but we're definitely looking for two guns, just on the basis of a fired cartridge, even if the bullets are never found. Okay, now let's summarize 
pull together here all the kinds of marks that can be on a cartridge, because I have left out a couple. We've got the firing pin impression. I've talked about that. A firing pin scrape mark only for those guns that have a locked breech that are pulled apart by a linking mechanism, such as the Colt Browning design. We have the tool marks from the breech face that are printed right in the primer and sometimes in other parts of the head of the cartridge. The extractor gouge and override. The ejector mark with semi-automatics that knock the cartridges clear. I should point out, extractors and ejectors, of course, are not present in a revolver. With simple blowback design guns, an example would be this little Walther. If you go back and look at the cold I illustrated to you, the barrel and slide move rearward together for a short distance and then pull apart. This gun, the barrel stays in place and the slide simply goes straight back. In other words, the powder gases are pushing the bullet this way and at that same instant they're already pushing the slide that way. That's called a simple blowback design. That raises some new phenomena. Phenomena. That cartridge case in a blowback design gun is blown out against the chamber walls and it's also starting to move. In the locked breech design, the delayed unlocking system, the cartridge blows out against the chamber walls but in the next few milliseconds relaxes and this is before the action starts opening up, in other words before the cartridge gets pulled out of the chamber. So what I will typically see in cartridges from straight blowback guns are chamber marks, scuff marks on the cartridge itself. Again, if you're a shooter, pick up some 380s sometime and look at them. You'll usually see scuffed marks on the cartridge. 22 autoloaders are all straight blowback design. Cartridges from those will typically have a slight scuffing on the, on the wall of the cartridge. Pick up a 380 from a locked breech, a 380, and there are a few of them out there. The Llama is one example. You'll seldom see that. So those are ones I, I failed to mention earlier. Chamber striations, and finally one that's not even in this illustration, but I have a couple uh, here to, to describe. In the extraction and ejection from cartridges from semi-automatics, and for that matter full automatics, quite often the cartridge will come careening out of the action or tumbling out of the action and strike some portion of the ejection port. Well, what's an ejection port? That was this area here, for example, on this 45 automatic. They'll either strike something back in here, this portion, or even up here along the side. Wherever it happens, it on occasion happens with consistency, and it will leave a nice deep crease or indentation, such as we can see on this cartridge. And that again tells me I'm dealing with a semi-automatic gun as opposed to a bolt action or a lever action or a pump action. You simply can't operate those mechanisms fast enough to create this kind of uh, damage. These particular cartridges that I'm holding up are unique in another way. There are a certain number of guns, not many, a few by Heckler and Koch and some made by the Soviets in the Second World War that have fluted chambers. There are grooves cut in the chambers of the guns and this is to help break the cartridge free of the chamber. But what they do is leave little indentations or scorch marks along the casing. Once again, the sort of thing that the astute investigator might observe, certainly I would hope the laboratory would note, and if we didn't have a gun yet, that tells us much about what we can eliminate and how narrow our search can be restricted to in trying to find the gun that in this case fired these 5.56 millimeter cartridges. And there are a lot of firearms chambered for this round. But right now there's only one I know of that has a fluted chamber. And at this time, there's only one rifle made by H&K that's so chambered with a fluted chamber in 5.56 millimeter. There are others in other calibers that, again, are tip-offs to the kind of gun we're looking for. All right, we've looked at the various marks left on cartridges and how they can be used to identify the responsible gun as well as tell us something about it. I thought I'd just take one very brief moment to use this, this training tool, this court exhibit, for how the actual identification on a bullet is made. And this enlarged model of a bullet has a rifling engraving, a land impression here, here, and over here. And in the microscope that's used in the laboratory, we can put a test-fired bullet on one stage and the evidence bullet on another and see them through a, a split field where we can juxtapose them optically. And all of that is done is after the bullets are phased, after they're brought into alignment such as you see here, simply rotate one of the two bullets, your choice, until we find sufficient correspondence in the fine striations, the tool marks that are left by the imperfections in the barrel of the gun. And I've said several times now, this doesn't always work, and that's because we've got a number of things that can occur. Damage to the bullet can be substantial. It obliterates the information. 
or we can have a gun that just doesn't reproduce marks very well. It's leaving um, leading in the barrel with each shot, or the bullets basically wobble down the bore, uh, and it just simply doesn't leave reproducible marks. But that we can determine by test firing. So in summary, a trained, skilled examiner, if he can find, or she, can find sufficient correspondence in the individual characteristics, they'll fall in alignment with one another. They'll represent a continuum, not only in the rifling engravings, but in these striations. Let's look at a very different type of ammunition, shotgun ammunition. The illustration, the drawn illustration uh, presently shown, we can see some very different features. First of all, we don't see a projectile or a bullet. And we see a cartridge that's not made of metal, of steel or brass, but rather largely paper or plastic. In this country, most are now plastic. In other parts of the world, the cartridge, this area in green, is paper. The bottom of the cartridge, or head as it's more properly called, will be some sort of metal, either brass or steel, inside of which will be some sort of propellant, one of the kinds we've previously seen, usually a flake powder of some kind, disc flake or the lamelles, or ball powder. There is, again, a centrally located primer, so it's a center fire type cartridge with the same sort of composition, at least in American ammunition, as we saw earlier. But above that powder charge can be several types of waddings. Now, this illustration shows you contemporary American ammunition that have plastic wads or shot cups. These hold shot, small lead uh, alloyed pellets. They may also be copper, they may also be steel, but generally, and more commonly, at least traditionally, they are lead. And their size uh, can vary considerably. And of course, given that, the number that we can put inside of one of these shells can vary. Let's go back to the wads. These wads can take on a great variety of forms. Some of them are quite intriguing in the geometry that companies have put in there. And these are all patented processes. So the wad has to carry and push the shot out of the smooth bore of a shotgun. No riflings in there. It has to protect the shot from rubbing against the inside of the bore, so it basically cradles or cups it in the versions you're now looking at. And then once clear of the barrel, the wad, like a booster rocket, simply falls away. It has some ballistic characteristics of it own, its own, but it doesn't go very far. But it also, since it has to fit the bore, tells us something about the gauge, which is the nomenclature used to describe the size of the bore, the diameter of the bore in a shotgun. And commonly, there's 12 gauge, 16 gauge, 20 gauge, and although it's somewhat of a misnomer, 410 gauge. That's really a caliber. It's .410 diameter. So 12 gauge, they go just in reverse. The small number means it's bigger. A 12 gauge is about a 73 caliber, .73 inches across. And here, for example, is a 12 gauge shotgun shell. It's plastic. This particular one's made by Winchester. And we can see some written information on here. This is also diagnostic. We're going to have three entries on most American shotgun shells. The three and a quarter is called the DRAM equivalent. It's an archaic term that was carried over from black powder days at the turn of the century that related to the amount of powder, smokeless powder now, that you have to put in the shell to be equivalent to, in this case, three and one quarter DRAM of black gunpowder. It's really an expression of the velocity ultimately. The one in the middle here tells me that there's one ounce of pellets, of shot, inside this shell. And finally, the number eight tells me something about the size of these pellets. And if we were to disassemble this shell, that can be easily done with a scalpel or razor blade, simply cut open this cartridge and make a window available, uh, we could look at the wadding in there and, and how it's arranged. Uh, you can also see that there's great variety in, in color and writing on these shells, how much of this brass base uh, exists. This one on your right uh, is a paper shell. The other two are plastic. So again, much variety, and that's great from a forensic or criminalistic standpoint. If all shotgun shells were the same, uh, finding them at a scene other than, than basically saying a shotgun was used wouldn't be very exciting. These wads have other ballistic characteristics. They emerge from the barrel of the gun basically with the same velocity of the shot. They will have imprints of the shot that they carried that are forced in there by the sudden accelerative forces. They'll have powder residues on their base that we may be able to compare with a kind of propellant in the shell or in the barrel of the gun. Now you've seen how, briefly, how bullets are identified. 
One of the troubling things for us all about shotguns is we cannot match the pellets, the BBs, the shot, to the gun that fired it. And that should make sense now because if it's in there cushioned and protected from ever rubbing the barrel, it's hopeless. Even in older shells that have fibrous wads that we'll see in a moment, where the shot does rub the barrel, the ability to reproduce that event, to find another BB that rubbed the barrel in just the same way is basically a, a lost cause and not done. But the wads, on the other hand, especially the plastic ones that were in this illustration, if they rub across a rough barrel, a sawed-off shotgun, for example, that hasn't been uh, re-crowned or re-finished at the muzzle, there, in those instances, we can on occasion match the wad back to the shotgun that fired it. But that's a pretty rare event. A couple of illustrations from the manufacturers. And these sort of brochures are handy things to get if you are involved in firearms cases and want to keep abreast of the field. This particular illustration helps us in two respects. It shows us the range of size of shot that's available. This is from Remington's advertisement. And the shot in shotgun shells can be as small as number nine, which measures out .08 inches in diameter. It can be as large as triple aught buck, which is basically the size of some, some pistol bullets, .36 caliber or 36 caliber. Bird shot or normal shot goes up through BB size and that one at the end of our charts about 0.18 inches. Buck shot is available uh, in a number of sizes but commonly four and double aught are the ones that we'll encounter most often because they're popularly used in law enforcement and occasionally in, in the eastern part of the United States for hunting in populated areas because their range is very limited and as the name suggests buck shot it was originally intended for hunting deer. This illustration also shows us something else. Some of the Remington plastic wads now exposed to the windows cut in these shells and variations in the design of those wads. It also shows us BBs or shot that are copper plated. Just like that lube alloy coating on the Winchester 22 bullets, here we've got a situation where lead shot has now got a copper plating on it. And on the far right, normal chilled shot or lead shot. And finally, uh, there's something else that should be visible here, although subtle. A white powdery plastic material. This is a polyethylene or polypropylene buffering material, sometimes called GREX, G-R-E-X in the industry. It's in there to cushion the shot so when they are accelerated forward during firing and those thousands, tens of thousands of pounds of pressure I described earlier, they're not deformed as badly as they otherwise would be. That has ballistic characteristics. At close range, it's like terminal dandruff. It's all over, the victim and the scene. Uh, at close range, it follows the shot and the wad right on in. So while we're robbed of the opportunity to match the projectiles, the shot, with the responsible gun, uh, we've got a lot of other things we can deal with from a reconstruction standpoint. Here's another Remington entry that has occurred in the last five or six years. Steel shot, because of the concern with lead in the environment, uh, virtually all the manufacturers in this country also offer steel shot. Remington's gone one further, and as now I believe of, as of other country, con companies, excuse me, and that is to put two different sizes of shot in the same shell. Ten years ago, if you'd brought me pellets from a body that were two different sizes, I'd say the person's been shot at twice, and hits were scored both times with two different sizes of shot. May mean two guns just, or just two shots. Now we've got a situation where we can find two shot sizes of shot with a single blast or discharge. Here's some actual fired wads from casework years ago that will give you some feeling for the great variety in these wads. With one exception, there is one that's unfired, the one on your left that's a sort of creamy white. That's an unfired uh, plastic shot cup. Uh, there's a shot shell there with that same sort of nomenclature, the three-digit entry that I described. Uh, but now we've got a fired Remington power piston. How do I know that? By the sort of figure eight features in the bottom of the shot cup or plastic wad. We've got some that are just fibrous wads, a more old-fashioned or traditional style. There are three of those indicated here. Here's an over-powder wad, the wad that's immediately next to the powder that's plastic. And then some sort of strange-looking things that look like discolored strips of uh, plasticized paper or simply just strips of plastic that have all sorts of little dimples and indents in them. That's a little collar that's put in most Winchester shotgun shells. And it also, as do all of these things, except the shell, uh, go out the muzzle of the gun upon discharge. And they have ballistic characteristics and features of their own that tell us something about the gauge, the brand of the ammunition, and given their ballistic characteristics, which is determinable, 
something about the distance between the gun and where the shot went. In other words, we can use that to determine where the shooter was uh, and how far away he was. If these things are located, and first of all, we've got to know what we're looking for. And that finding a little squiggly piece of plastic like uh, this shot collar is evidence and not just some remnant or something from a chewing gum package. Here's another Remington shell uh, from an actual case years ago that became very interesting just because of the difference in these entries. One says two and a quarter, one says two and a half dram equivalent. One of them is virtually unobtainable anymore. It's so rare. And that happens to be what the subject was using. Even though he got rid of the gun, he had ammunition of this type in his possession and a fired round of that type was at the scene. And that became extremely important in that particular case. Another Remington power piston is shown just above that. Here's a contemporary buckshot load in 12 gauge. This happens to be a Winchester shell, and has Super X on the side of it, which is one of their brand descriptors. And we've got two fibrous or cardboard wads in this shell that are basically the, the caliber or the gauge of the gun. Uh, we have a bunch of this Grex material, this white polypropylene, and I've removed several of the pellets. With buckshot, there will be a discrete number of pellets per shell. With the very small shot, there'll be a range. If you put an ounce of very, very small pellets in a shell, you may have 270 in one and 275 in the other. But with buckshot, there'll be a discrete number, and that, again, uh, can be useful because the same company may make you three loadings in, in the same size of buckshot. And that's what I've shown you in this example. At the top is a three-inch 12-gauge Remington buckshot shell. And it has 15 pellets in it. And if you start following through with me and look at the wads that are in this particular shell, there's a green plastic over powder wad, the one right next to the powder, and then a filler wad uh, above that of cardboard or fibrous material. Look at the dimensions. There are different thicknesses or lengths depending on how many pellets were in this shell. The one in the middle is a two and three quarter inch long shell, still 12 gauge, still made by Remington, and it was loaded with 12 pellets. And finally, uh, We've got one that's, again, a two and three-quarter inch shell uh, with nine pellets, the more common version. Well, you'd again think, well, just count the pellets in the body. Well, we may only have a hit with three out of nine or three out of 15 pellets, but if we can find the wads between the victim and where those wads are located, we now have an extrapolation line to go back and look for the shooter's position. And once we locate where those wads are, and know their ballistic characteristics, we can say how far back along that line the shooter was. And that given the type of wads where it was a 15 pellet load or a 12 pellet load, and if we can find the spent round, that sort of information may be labeled or determinable, determinable uh, from the cartridge itself. So there's an interrelationship between these class characteristics, as they're called. The range of shotguns, I mentioned that uh, the, the pellets because they disperse from the gun, obey certain physical and mathematical principles. They're basically radiating out from a central point, coning out over distance. And basically, they obey a straight line. If we look at the upper graph of range or distance uh, versus pattern diameter, in other words, what sort of a circle would all of those pellets, whether they be small shot or buckshot, what sort of a circle would they fit in? While at contact, I imagine it's not hard to envision that if this gun, this shotgun, of nominally 0.73 inches is right up against me, I'm going to basically have a three-quarter inch hole with all the pellets and all the powder that's not burned and the wads going right on in. If we start getting a separation distance, now we've got wads that are falling away from the shot charge and leaving injuries of their own. They may be sticking in my coat or my skin. We still may have a mass of shot that's basically going in the body, but there'll come a point where we start getting satellite pellets around the uh, injury site. And finally, we'll just have a pattern of pellets that basically will fit inside a circle if the shot is delivered at a 90 degree angle to the surface. And that's what I'm illustrating in the lower picture, trying to summarize muzzle of the gun, gunshot residues that we've already talked about, a fanning out or a coning out of the shot shown over here at the far right, and a diameter of that pattern based on distance. And somewhere in between uh, substantial range such as 20 yards or 50 yards, those wads are going to fall to the ground, and they're out there somewhere. And they'll typically be in the same area for that particular gun and ammunition combination. 
Now this group of dots that's being projected is a useful way to, to learn something else about shotgun blast. This is a reconstruction of an actual pattern of number four buckshot, a 27 pellet load of buckshot. And I can use this in, in demonstrations such as this to show you what happens when we either shoot at an angle or shoot against things that aren't nice flat pieces of paper. And if I simply start moving forward, now we're going to have some strikes that look like they're grazing shots across my body. Others that are going basically straight in from your viewpoint. Or if I lean away, now we have an ellipse. Well, there's a mathematical relationship of the major diameter to the minimum diameter in an ellipse. And with a little pocket calculator, if you use the sine or cosine function, I can tell you the approximate angle that a blast of shot came into a surface from by the size, the dimensions of that ellipse. Likewise, if we make the foolish mistake of taking my jacket from the medical examiner's office and laying it out on a flat table, we're going to see some pellet strikes that are coming in at a grazing angle, the ones that were coming across my forward torso, and others that are going straight into the jacket, leaving nice round holes. And if you don't have this concept in mind, you could make some erroneous conclusions that we basically got more than one shot, grazing shots and straight in shots. No, you've got a pattern of shot that was inside of a circle that's hitting a cylinder, basically a cylindrical object. So this sort of information and understanding about shotgun ammunition and its ballistic behavior can be very useful in reconstructing the crime and establishing the range as well as the position of the shooter. This next illustration from one of the industry publications shows one of these plastic wads actually emerging from the muzzle, just a few inches from it. The shot string is still closely aggregated. The petals on this plastic wad are just starting to open up as they encounter air resistance. Think of this like a badminton birdie in reverse, that it's going to open up, encounter wind resistance, and it's going to do a turnaround. In this drawing from a trial many years ago, I'm illustrating how a similar wad, the Remington power piston, opens up within a few inches of the muzzle, and then because the center of gravity is aft toward the rear, it naturally will turn around at point three and four. And this will occur again and again in a very reproducible fashion with the particular wad gun combination. It can be used to establish range. And the reason this is useful is at very short distances, shotgun blasts all produce basically a round entry hole. All the pellets are going through one opening. And that could be the case at 10 inches or at 30 inches. But the wad, the power piston type wad, is going to behave very differently at those two distances. And so that could be the difference between a suicide, a shotgun that I'm holding just a few inches from me and discharging with my extended hand or reaching up with my toe, or a shotgun that fell off a table, hit the floor and discharged from three feet away. The entry hole from the pellets is going to be indistinguishable in most cases. But what the wad does to that body, or to me in this example, is going to be quite different. And here's an actual autopsy picture. If you look at it carefully, we'll see a number of things. First of all, here's one of these types of wads. This one doesn't happen to be Remington, so I don't mean to be picking on any one company. They all behave basically the same way. Here are the petals we can see on it, and this is an entry wound, a rather serious one in a man's head. And we can see two red rectangular slap marks. And that's where two of the four petals of that wad basically slapped against the living skin and left a, an abrasion, an image of themselves. There are even some little satellite punctate marks here. That's the powder, the powder particles that are coming out in miniature shotgun blast fashion and also telling us that the range is close. So we could actually do test firings as long as we've got the gun and more of the same ammunition and establish at what distance do we see this. Is it 10 inches, 1 foot, or is it 2 and 3 feet? Could be, again, the difference between a homicide and a suicide. It's another type of wad I mentioned in brief, um, but also gives us some interesting phenomena from a ballistic standpoint. This particular Winchester round that I held up earlier has this plastic shot collar that you saw after firing. This is what it looks like before firing. That's curled or rolled around inside the shell to protect the shot from scraping the bore, the inside of the barrel of the gun. There are three other wads, cardboard or fibrous wads here. You might notice one of them has actually taken up the image of the pellets that it fired, so I could determine the size of shot from such an imprint in a wad. And I have the gauge from the size of that wad. And finally, 
from this little shot collar, we're back into a situation where we might be able to resolve one foot versus two or three feet. If you imagine this little curled piece being fired out of a gun, it's certainly not going to carry very far. It's just flapping around in the, in the relative wind and the breeze that it's encountered by being discharged. And it indeed does so uh, very quickly. This from a Winchester publication shows the emergence of shot with these three wads and the shot collar. And at nine inches, it's basically still wrapped around the shot. As we get out to about 18 inches, the wads are starting to fall away and this collar is starting to unfurl. And in the last lower picture, it's basically unfurled out around uh, two feet or so. This is an actual case that was sent to me for other reasons. And one of the issues was that this man who, who shot his estranged wife had done so from some considerable distance, uh, 10, 15 feet away. This is the entry wound in this black and white photograph. And right away, without even firing the gun, I can tell you that was a lot closer than 10 or 15 feet. But notice this little injury in the skin over here to the 8 o'clock position. That's that collar, that plastic collar, still flying edgewise with in a sort of a crescent shape with enough energy to actually break the skin. So we once again have a situation we can control the variables. We've got the gun, more of the same ammunition, important to seize more of the very same if it's at all possible, or put it on a search warrant to be secured, and test fire the gun against suitable test media, such as those described by Dr. Fackler, uh, skin tissue simulants from uh, freshly sacrificed uh, pigs, uh, so on, to establish where do we see this kind of phenomena and is it reproducible and consistent. Now, lead shot is not necessarily unique to shotgun shells. There are some products that contain it in bulleted ammunition. And this is an example that's been uh, popularly uh, promoted. The particular one I have here is a Glazer 9mm Parabellum cartridge. It's also available in a number of other calibers, but it's constructed in a rather interesting fashion. We have a copper jacket, much like many of the other bullets we've seen, inside of which is not a lead core, but a large number of very small lead shot capped by a blue nylon ball. All of these things, of course, emerge from the gun barrel when they enter the target. The jacketing expands or breaks away, usually into many fragments, releasing the shot into the injury site or target. Should be noted that that blue nylon ball doesn't show up on x-ray, so some clues to the pathologist and surgeon. Finding copper jacket fragments and, of course, very small lead shot clearly says we don't have a shotgun, yet we've got shot. A search for this small blue ball would cinch it that we have this particular product, the Glazer safety slug, as it's been called. And then the laboratory can do its identification work if the appropriate number of fragments of the jacket are found that bore against the barrel of the gun, the, the riflings. There are other shot cartridges available. Here's a shot cartridge even in 22 rimfire, about the smallest you can get. It could be shot in any 22 revolver, or semi-automatic pistol if you can get it loaded into the gun easily. Uh, and of course the rifle I showed you earlier, any 22 rifle. Uh, designed for pest control, shooting rats and mice in the barn without destroying the barn. But they've been shot at, at people also. Here's a 357 Magnum cartridge with this yellow plastic cap on it, inside of which is a number of, as I recall, number 12 shot. Might be as large as number 9, but that's easy to determine. We'll just disassemble one. This plastic cartouche or cartridge around it also over short distance has ballistic characteristics of its own just like the wads and could be used along with the pattern of shot to establish range so long as we get more of these and we've got the gun. Earlier I held up a nice government 45 automatic. This pistol here, here's a cartridge that's been designed with even a step in it and a, and a crimp so it will negotiate out of the magazine up through the feed ramp and into battery and even work the mechanism of this pistol. This particular one's made by Omark or CCI and it's loaded not with a bullet but with shot. Of course the number of pellets and the size are going to be greatly reduced over a shotgun shell but I offer those uh, just so we understand that shot can be found in some other other formats. Here's a slide we've seen earlier with a mixture of 22 rimfire ammunition with various types of projectiles uh, loaded in them. The case I'm going to show you is an example of where an individual has used such an assortment of ammunition in a revolver. This occasionally happens. There seems to be a certain element out there that scrounges up ammunition to use in their firearm, and this can be very useful. In this particular case example, we have a situation where there was a backyard party that got out of hand. 
Uh, one of the participants assaulted the homeowner, the party giver, the host, uh, by breaking a beer bottle, coming toward him, so went the account, uh, whereupon the homeowner produced this revolver that we see here on the table. A little closer view. So let me stop a moment. Is there any reason to fingerprint this gun? Not really. He owns it. Uh, he admits holding it. He admits shooting it. It's how and why this shooting took place that's important, not what is the responsible gun or making a firearms identification. So as an investigating officer uh, approaching this case, we have a person who's describing a self-defense situation that the subject got out of hand, uh, started uh, becoming obnoxious, broke the bottle, came toward him. He armed himself, fired a warning shot into the ground, so there's shot one. The subject came closer. He fired a warning shot into the air. Now we have two shots. And finally, when the subject was virtually on top of him, about to jam the bottle into his throat, he fired, whereupon the decedent, the now decedent, uh, fell. So we get in a little closer to this gun. After photographing it and documenting it in place as to what it looks like, then it should be marked with something like a Sharpie-type permanent marker, uh, even whiteout, something that will leave a mark uh, on each side of the cylinder, on each side of the back strap, such as you see here. Then, and only then, can we carefully open the revolver in this case and look at the arrangement of cartridges. Now, I've reproduced the three types of cartridges that show a firing pin impression. These cartridges are not taken from the gun. They're simply put here for illustration. The fired cartridges amount to a Winchester Wildcat. That's the stylized W. The next one, a Federal. That's the letter F with, again, a firing pin impression present in it. And finally, a cartridge with the letter U, the Remington cartridge. And if we look at those bullets, we can see we've got three different types of finishes on the bullet. We later learn uh, that the cylinder in this revolver rotates counterclockwise. So I've put an arrow on it just for instructional purposes. That would later be learned at the laboratory. But the important thing is you, if you're an investigating officer or arriving officer, have marked this cylinder so we know which cartridge was under the hammer. And that's the one with the letter U. I'll study this a moment and determine which would have been fired first, second, and third. Well, clearly the one under the hammer would be the last shot. That's the Remington cartridge. What if the cylinder had been advanced, if the subject had elected to cock the gun for a potential fourth shot and then decided against it and let the hammer down? Then we'd have a situation where that Remington cartridge, the letter U, would be offset one position. If investigators rush in and clear the weapon initially, all of this information is going to be lost. Here we have a pretty well done documentation of the evidence. So let's go back to the shooter's account. If indeed he's telling us the truth, then the bullet in the decedent should be Remington bullet, the last shot. What if in fact autopsy reveals a plain lead bullet, the Winchester bullet? Then we have a person who's mistaken at best and lying to us at worst because the first shot, the Winchester bullet, is the one in the decedent and the other two are misses. And this account, this story is simply a fabrication to try to cover up what actually happened. Of course, revolvers aren't always used in, in shootings and ammunition isn't always mixed, but this is something that's important to do in each case. And I'll show you one last example from a very famous case of how a diagram then would be the last step in documenting what we see in a situation like this. This is a center fire uh, revolver wherein we've got not only fired cartridges and unfired cartridges, but we also have a misfire. And this really doesn't have to be fancy. I've even seen it written on the back of a breathalyzer test record card by an officer who had nothing else to write on at the time. So simply a little diagram that shows how many chambers are in the cylinder, what cartridges are in those chambers, a brief description of the head stamp. We now know what that is. Um, and then finally, after this is all done, these cartridges are going to be removed. Now let's talk about marking of the evidence itself. Revolvers such as this we've talked about already and marking the cylinder. But if we're going to identify this gun later as the revolver that we found at a scene or seized from an individual or recovered, uh, we need to have not only its serial number, but some mark that's unique, our initials and a date somewhere on it. Uh, good choices are inside the frame, for example, which won't permanently deface the firearm, on the yoke or crane. 
As long as one's consistent, you'll always be able to find that mark at a later hearing or trial. If it's something that doesn't lend itself to some common place, then make a note in your report uh, or supplement as to where you placed your initials. Some agencies, I should point out, do have a prohibition against marking uh, firearms and even ammunition components. Uh, if that's the case, then a tag suitably affixed somewhere through the trigger guard with your, again, initials, date, case number if there is one by then, and again, the serial number. Serial numbers are trickier than you might think. For example, on Smith & Wesson's, uh, the number that appears in this area isn't necessarily a serial number. It's a frame number, and the serial number is on the butt. Here we've got a gun that has the butt covered up with an enclosing uh, grip. So there are some potential uh, problems with trusting to serial number alone. With some old World War II firearms, certain serial numbers were duplicated on the same make and model of gun. Let's look at a semi-automatic, how we might mark it if we're going to elect to do so. Well, this is one we've looked at before. It has a slide which conceals the barrel. And if we don't wish to face the gun itself, and it may be something that's of value to be returned to a victim of a burglary. Uh, and we also want to mark it in such a way that we're dealing with a component that's a part of the identification chain, something that contacted the bullet and cartridge. So I wouldn't want to mark on the grips. They can be removed. But here we've got an easy answer. Once we've got to the point where we are going to secure and clear the weapon, it's still in our custody, uh, we could mark it here on the barrel. It's normally concealed by the slide. Alternatively, we could mark it here on the side of the chamber with a small a pen knife or something that will scrape in a, a serial number, our serial number, uh, ID number, initials, or dates. Something that we can identify and, and say as a mark we place there. Let's look at ammunition components. We've seen already where the basic identifying information is located on a cartridge. We've got the head stamp area uh, where the breech face signature, firing pin impression, extractor and ejector marks are located, so that's certainly a, a prohibited area. Uh, we may have chamber marks on the side of a cartridge or magazine lip marks that I discussed earlier. So we've got to make some intelligent judgments here. Uh, some authors have even recommended, I'll use another cartridge here, uh, putting initials inside the mouth of the case. Well, that's possible with larger cartridges, but it's virtually impossible with something as small as a 22 rimfire. So it comes down to making some judgment of looking at the cartridge after you've seized it or impounded it, and seeing if there's a clear area that lacks any marks that may have been caused by the firearm that chambered it or fired it. And then so initialing it, and again, possibly a date if you wish. There's another philosophy to marking uh, cartridges and bullets, and that is to simply place them in a secure container. So we could have taken that cartridge, or a bullet that I'll get to in a moment, and put it in some sort of suitable vial. Film cans are great. They don't break, and they're pretty sturdy. So we could put a place, piece of tissue paper or Kleenex, not cotton, inside this vial, place the cartridge or bullet in there, another piece of tissue on top of it so it doesn't rattle around and dislodge trace evidence, seal it, and then thoroughly tape seal the container, initial and date the container, case number perhaps, and I assure you that the criminalist or firearms examiner in the laboratory will be careful to leave your seal identifiable and your initials, cut through it in a certain area, reseal it. So you'll be able to find those marks and seals uh, at trial. Bullets. Again, we've talked about where the identifying information is located on the bearing surface. But I've also shown you powder imprints on the base of the bullet. Uh, there may be trace evidence from impact or ricochet, uh, other questions. So you once again need to make a judgment call. Certainly the bearing surface is not acceptable. The base may be acceptable if you look at it and see that there's a pristine area with no indications of something that might be of evidentiary value, no adhering powder particles or imprints, then fine. The base is, is a great place to initial and possibly date this bullet. We could use any area of the nose of the bullet that doesn't have any visible trace evidence. The same philosophy, however, is employed by some agencies of simply securing the item in a container and sealing and marking the container. And no problem with that as long as you properly seal and mark it and, of course, the people that handle it later uh, note those seals and don't deface them. I've mentioned several times trace evidence on bullets. I'm going to show you an actual case that hasn't been completely litigated yet, but it's a great learning exercise. 
This first picture is a police photograph which I have re-photographed and noted a bullet laying on a driveway. Briefly, the situation in this case is a man shot to death in front of a house. Bullet passes completely through. There's a search of the area, of course, to locate the bullet. This is a neighborhood where finding bullets is not uncommon. So one of the, one of the important issues in this case is this bullet that you're now looking at, the fatal bullet. And of course, no gun has been recovered yet. There's a substantial number of potential suspects. So something about the gun that fired it from the rifling characteristics, what brand of bullet, what caliber, what weight, um, and of course, any adhering trace evidence that might tell us whether or not it passed through a human being. To illustrate this, I've got the fatal bullet, or I'm sorry, the bullet from the driveway shown on the upper left. We can see land and groove impressions. They can be measured and counted. And when that's done, we find that it's five right, land widths equal to the grooves. It's 38 slash 357 caliber. Uh, a fairly short list of guns that could, could fire this 357 Magnum bullet are available. And they basically amount to Ruger, certain Rugers, and Smith and Wessons chambered in 357 Magnum. This bullet is not available in 38 Special. So we've got a fairly narrow range of guns that could have fired it. You can also see some pretty substantial damage to this bullet, two areas of impact up near the nose toward the top of that bullet's view. Below it is a cartridge case, a Winchester 357 Magnum cartridge case that's seized from one of the suspect's homes. No gun is found, but a cartridge case made by the same company in the same cartridge designation, 357 Magnum. So that would seem uh, suspicious and suggest that he may be involved in the shooting. Next to the evidence bullet from the driveway and the evidence cartridge casing seized from a subject is another Winchester 357 Magnum cartridge with a fired bullet. This is one that I produced. Now, if you're observant, you'll notice something different about those two cartridge cases. One of them has a case cantilever and the other one does not. We'll come back to the importance of that in a moment. To the far right is an unfired loaded round of Winchester 357 Magnum ammunition. So this allows you to see not only that case cantilever before it's somewhat blown out by the firing process, but also it allows you to see where the cartridge is crimped into the bullet. It's crimped into a smooth groove below which are three knurled cantilevers. Here's the same slide with one exception. The evidence bullet has been rotated so we can see the opposite side. And when we do that, we see that it's covered with a textured impact imprint. So this bullet, if it has gone through a body, is now tumbling and hits something with a very textured nature in a broadside fashion. Returning to the cartridge cases, the evidence cartridge below the evidence bullet, notice that it lacks a case cantilever, whereas the cartridge is next to it have one. Now let's go in and look at the mouth of these cartridge cases. That's the opening out of which the bullet emerged. On the left is the evidence cartridge casing seized from the suspect's home. On the right is one that I fired with the Winchester Lubaloy type semi-wad cutter lead bullet. And if you look carefully, you'll see some hatching or indentations around the evidence cartridge that are not present in the exemplar cartridge. Let's go in a little closer on the evidence cartridge and we can see this with a little more detail. And closer still, here's a highly magnified picture. Even though this phenomena was visible with the naked eye and would be, invisible to, would be visible to an astute investigator with good lighting, what you're looking at is the imprint of a cantilever from a jacketed bullet. Now remember, a jacketed bullet is made of copper, which is fairly tough stuff compared to lead. And that cartridge case that originally held this bullet was crimped into that jacketed bullet and left its image in the mouth of the case. So what is this saying? That the cartridge case, although it's a Winchester cartridge and although it's a 357 Magnum cartridge, could not have held the lead bullet that was found at the scene. So there is no relationship between those two. Let's look a little more about the bullet and trace evidence. In this slide, you're looking straight down on the nose of the bullet from the driveway. What you are seeing are at least three things. The damage that I talked about earlier, I'll describe it as secondary damage. The flat, 
abraded areas on the side of the nose of this bullet. But more importantly, you're looking at a fabric imprint that hatched a ribbed pattern across the nose of this bullet, the flattened nose of this bullet, is a fabric imprint. And there are even fibers embedded in the lead of this Lubeloy bullet, black uh, synthetic fibers. So clearly the first thing this bullet hit was fabric against a soft surface, basically a body, uh, which flattened the nose of the bullet. And then after that, it's hit something else at least twice on its edges, and yet a third time. And the question is, of course, the sequence of those events, and what did it hit? So in summary, we now know this is a bullet that hit something soft, presumably a body. It certainly was covered with fabric. What should we be doing? Collecting the clothing of the decedent. If he lived at the hospital, if he went to the autopsy room from the, from the morgue, to compare those fibers and that fabric imprint with the nose of this bullet. Because this is one of the important questions. Is this the fatal bullet? Let's look at the side of the bullet. Now this is a highly magnified picture through my comparison microscope, bullet comparison microscope. And I've labeled on this photograph one of those areas of secondary damage. But more importantly, I've circled a little area of some stringy amber material. That's tissue. This is why I said it's important for criminalists in other sections of the laboratory, serologists, for example, to understand the needs of the firearms examiner and vice versa. If the firearms examiner isn't qualified to do uh, tissue testing or species identification, if there were any doubt that this is human tissue, that's a step we could take of carefully removing this little stringer of tissue and getting that tested in the serology unit. Let's look at some more information on this bullet. In one of these areas of secondary damage that I've circled is some very light yellow, almost white, architectural paint. How do I know it's architectural paint? By its dull appearance, there are opacifiers in architectural paint that are not in vehicle paint. Um, we can test it chemically and non-destructively, which was done, to demonstrate the elemental composition. And again, there are differences between architectural paint uh, and automotive paint. So now we've got a bullet that's gone through a body, it's got fibers, it's got tissue, it's then hit a very irregular surface, it's hit an architecturally painted surface that's light yellow, the house happened to be light yellow, before it finally ended up on the driveway. So it's collected all of these things on its journey to its final resting place that allow one to do a reconstruction, to approach a reconstruction and establish this is the fatal bullet, and now we know something if we can locate those impact areas about the orientation of the shooter when we place the body in line with that. You've just seen an interesting example of trace evidence on a bullet after it's gone through a body. Here are a couple of cases of bullets with trace evidence before they strike a body and how useful and important they can be. The two bullets you're looking at here, or I'm sorry, the bullet you're looking at here in two views is a lead semi-wad cutter bullet. We can see the rifling engravings on it. Uh, it too happened to be five right. The reverse side of that bullet with the finder's initials in it, is heavily striated and lacks any of the original characteristics of the gun that fired it or even the manufacturer's characteristics. The reason is this is a ricochet. It has struck the ground, a very abrasive surface, prior to hitting the victim. We can see some uh, particles or we can find particles of soil, minerals, concrete, asphalt, depending upon the substrate, embedded in the soft bullet metal that will allow us to confirm what I already know by visual appearance. Let's look at another one from a large Midwestern city. Uh, this one also still being litigated, so I can't give you the city. This is one of my photographs that I prepared in preparation for trial of a Remington 357 Magnum uh, copper jacketed bullet. How do we know it's a Remington? Here's that scallop that I talked to you about earlier with the exposed lead nose. And then this large abrasive area on one side of the bullet is the area where it made a very shallow impact uh, with a sidewalk. And how do I know it's a sidewalk? Because of embedded uh, particles of silica, sand, quartz sand, and other calcium minerals that are used in concrete. Here, in fact, is one of the test bullets that I prepared uh, in illustrating how you can estimate the angle of impact by the, the nature of the damage on the bullet. And these were simply done by setting up an experiment where I could fire a like gun with these bullets coming in at known angles and a recovery device to collect them after they rebounded or ricocheted off of the concrete. It produces a very characteristic, reproducible phenomena. What else is going to happen? I showed you bullet holes in cloth and bullet wiping. Um, 
this bullet, after it rebounds off of the sidewalk, is now going to be destabilized. It's not going to be flying point first and tumbling. This looks at the other, gives us a view of the good side, the pristine side of the bullet, the same evidence bullet that I've just described to you. So now we can really see the Remington characteristics showing up and the rifling engraving, so we can determine the kind of gun that fired it if we didn't already have it. But most of all, here's the jacket of the decedent and the bullet hole, somewhat in quotes, into that jacket. We don't see the bullet wiping that I showed you earlier. We don't see a nice round hole. In fact, it looks more like a tear or a snag. Those same chemical tests, the dithiooxamide test and the sodium rhodesinate test, uh, could be and were used to confirm this was a bullet hole. And of course, it also matched with the entry wound into the victim. And you might say, well, it should have been apparent that this was a ricochet. The particular medical examiner uh, didn't understand or appreciate that, wasn't prepared to call it a, a deflected or a ricocheted bullet, uh, even though all of these features clearly say that. So the uh, important thing is, looking at the trace evidence on the bullet that may be generated by an impact prior to that with a victim or subsequent to, they can all tell us a story about where this bullet has been and what's happened to it prior to or subsequent to its impact with the body. By now, you should know the proper names of various ammunition components and their features. A cartridge, for example, versus a bullet. A cartridge case. Rim fire versus center fire. A primer, propellants, or gunpowder. What head stamps are. Lead bullets versus jacketed bullets. I've also given you some insight into the great variety that exists in ammunition and how that can be useful in evaluating shooting incidents. Yet there are a number of things I haven't been able to cover. How caliber is determined or named, for example. Uh, why a 3006, a 3030, a 300 Savage, and a 308 Winchester are named as they are if they can all shoot 30 caliber bullets of the same basic type. There are some other sources of information beyond this tape I'd like to recommend to you that are inexpensive and very good. For example, the NRA publishes a firearms ammunition fact book an excellent publication that we'll review and add to, much of what you've already seen. Other books from the National Rifle Association that are excellent. Their Firearms Assembly series that will show you the proper names and components of each firearm you're apt to encounter. A basic book on hand loading it is an inexpensive investment that will tell you more about propellants, bullets, their design, and the sort of uh, ballistic information that may be of value. Although not published by the NRA, this also is an excellent book, Cartridges of the World, that will allow you to understand something about the naming system and what these head stamps mean and the countries of origin. Simply brochures from the manufacturers of ammunition. These are free handouts that are available in many gun shops. I've got the Remington, Winchester, and Federal uh, here that will diagram shotgun shells and their various series of ammunition. These don't cost you a thing. As far as gunshot wounds, the top of the line textbook, in my opinion at this time, is Dr. Vincent DeMeo's excellent text by Elsevier Publishing Company. This should be in your library. There are books on criminalistics, current books, that have sections on firearms evidence, uh, but they're not directed totally to firearms evidence. Nonetheless, they are of, of considerable value. The Forensic Science Handbook by Dr. Safferstein, and his other book on criminalistics, an introduction to forensic science. Barry Fisher has rewritten Svensson and Wendell's book, Techniques of Crime Scene Investigation, that has a unit on firearms evidence. And Peter DeForest, Bob Ganselin, and Henry Lee, this excellent book, also with a section on firearms evidence. And finally, an older book, but also quite good, uh, John Thornton's rewrite of Paul Kirk's book on crime investigation. Well, I hope you found this information useful and informative as you play and replay this tape, and in the next series we'll look at putting it all together in the reconstruction of shootings.